Okej, okay, ja. Men det kan vi ta, det hinner vi. Mm. It's uh, 50 minutes past 3 o'clock uh, already, so could we perhaps please everyone find a seat? So we can start this session and we're going to start with a welcome address by the president of our social democratic group, Iraqsa. And so I give you the floor first. Thank you for being here and thank you for speaking to us. Thank you, Agnes, and thank you all of you to be here in a, this important uh, event uh, for our political uh, family. As you know, we are in the beginning of the term. Uh, and uh, we are trying uh, to open important debates for us in our priorities, and that is the, one of the most important issues for us, for the social democracy, and I want to thank your presence here because your presence is a clear commitment to work together with us in a different uh, uh, levels, of course, aspects. Uh, as I can explain in the beginning of the term, for us, uh, the cooperation with the trade unions is very important, and for that I want to say thank you for to be here, and we will open very interesting uh, debate with uh, a common goals uh, for us as a social democrat, uh, as a trade unions, as a social civil society in, in Europe. En primer lugar, eh, me gustaría, por supuesto, agradecer a, a Agnes, a nuestra coordinadora de, de empleo, y a Helen, nuestra vicepresidenta del, del Buró en eh, los eh, asuntos eh, sociales y de, y de empleo, por haber organizado y haber tenido esta iniciativa tan, tan interesante. El momento no podría ser el más adecuado. Estamos, como decía al inicio, eh, comenzando la legislatura con una nueva comisión, eh, y con un nuevo Parlamento. Y en este sentido tenemos que aprovechar las circunstancias eh, especiales que se dan eh, al respecto de, de, esta, de esta cuestión. Y mm, también quería aprovechar el inicio de mi intervención para eh, agradecer eh, el que los sindicatos eh, hayáis querido participar con nosotros de, de este evento. Dejarme eh, agradecer en concreto a, a Luca Vicentini y a Oliver eh, Robke. Eh, el participar en este seminario, porque sin duda alguna esta cooperación, como digo, eh, finalmente, eh, si llega a buen puerto, será exitosa para valores y para ideas que compartimos eh, desde, desde la socialdemocracia, pero también desde el movimiento sindical europeo. Garantizar que todas las personas en la Unión Europea reciban un salario digno por su trabajo es una prioridad para nuestra familia política. A todos eh, los que estamos aquí nos indigna oír eh, los términos como trabajadores pobres, que últimamente se, se habla mucho de este término, y es verdad que hay una nueva clase eh, que se ha creado en Europa de trabajadores pobres, es decir, ya no solo hay problema de exclusión eh, y riesgo de pobreza a aquellas eh, personas que están desempleadas, sino que hay una clase trabajadora eh, que está en este riesgo de exclusión también por salarios que no son dignos. Y, por lo tanto, eso hace que tengamos que encontrar una mejor cauce de mantener unida a nuestra familia política en un debate eh, como este, entendiendo que puede haber diferentes eh, posiciones, pero que también tenemos objetivos comunes. El objetivo común de la socialdemocracia es mejorar la calidad de vida de los trabajadores, proteger los empleos, que sean empleos dignos. Y, por lo tanto, entendiendo que esas son las cuestiones que nos unen, la lucha por los salarios decentes fue una de nuestras banderas también durante la campaña electoral, durante la campaña europea. Uno de los compromisos más importantes también que nuestra familia política ha arrancado a la actual Comisión Europea, a la señora von der Leyen, donde en el primer eh, discurso que tuvo ante la Cámara en el Parlamento Europeo, donde trasladó cuáles eran sus prioridades políticas como comisión, incorporó esto como uno de los elementos, gracias al trabajo y a la presión que desde la socialdemocracia, que desde el Grupo de Socialistas y Demócratas hicimos. Y tampoco es casualidad que en el marco de la Comisión Europea haya responsables políticos como Nicolás, encargado de un tema tan importante como es eh, el del empleo y los derechos sociales. Recordáis eh, que el título inicial se refería solo 
a, al empleo y que fue gracias a la negociación de nuestro grupo cuando incorporamos la dimensión social, porque para nosotros una cosa no puede ser entendida sin la otra. No podemos hablar de más empleo si eso no viene acompañado de una mejor protección de los sistemas y de los derechos de los trabajadores. Y digo, no es casualidad eh, que, por lo tanto, tengamos ahora mismo en la Comisión Europea un comisario comprometido en sacar adelante el desarrollo de este pilar social y poder avanzar en estas políticas. Para nosotros, como familia política, es un orgullo contar con, con Nicolás y vamos a trabajar de forma estrecha. El manifesto del PES, eh, aprobado por unanimidad eh, hace casi un año, decía lo siguiente. Pelearemos por los salarios mínimos decentes en toda Europa. La pobreza de los trabajadores es moralmente y económicamente injustificable. El diálogo social efectivo y la sindicalización son la mejor manera de garantizar la protección de los trabajadores y de las trabajadoras y el aumento salarial. Además, debemos ser coherentes con nuestra insistencia en que se aplique el pilar de derechos sociales europeo, cuyo principio número seis se refiere a los salarios y reclama que todos los trabajadores y las trabajadoras tienen derecho a un salario justo que les permita llevar una vida digna. Añade que todos los salarios se deben establecer de una manera transparente y predecible según las prácticas nacionales y respetando la autonomía de los actores sociales. Es decir, que se respeten los sistemas nacionales que funcionan. Pero eso no puede impedir que el nivel europeo hagamos todo lo que podamos por mejorar las situaciones injustas y precarias de tantos trabajadores y trabajadoras. Tenemos que hacer, es una gran responsabilidad para nosotros hacer que sea compatible la defensa de los sistemas tradicionales que en estos momentos están funcionando con también garantizar mejoras eh, y, y garantías de salarios en aquellos lugares donde ahora mismo no existe esa garantía. Es inaceptable que la pobreza siga creciendo entre quienes trabajan. Hemos pasado de un índice de riesgo de pobreza entre los asalariados del 8% en 2010 al 9,2% en 2018. Esto significa que casi 20 millones de europeos y europeas están en riesgo de caer en la pobreza a pesar de que tienen empleo. Aquí vemos que hay un problema estructural que va más allá de establecer una ley de salarios mínimos. Eso es entendible y asumible por todos. Es preciso fortalecer la negociación colectiva sectorial y centralizada, dar estabilidad al empleo y a los contratos de trabajo, prohibir los contratos de cero horas… Eliminar los intermediarios del mercado laboral, que lo único que hacen es quitar dinero al trabajador. Y necesitamos, además, lugares de trabajo más democráticos, con una mayor participación de los trabajadores. Es evidente que el mundo del trabajo está en transformación y, además, es una transformación muy rápida. Pero no podemos asumir la precariedad y la desregulación como una fatalidad inevitable. Yo eh, lo decía eh, el día que votábamos eh, la Comisión Europea en su conjunto, el mensaje era claro, podremos eh, permitirnos equivocarnos en el camino, lo que jamás podremos permitirnos es no intentarlo. Y, por lo tanto, desde la política, cuando llegamos a la política es para ser útiles a la sociedad y es para intentar cambiar las cosas. Eh, y estamos en una situación difícil, es evidente, pero ante las dificultades la socialdemocracia no le puede dar la espalda a este tipo de situaciones. Eh, la, negociación, la cuestión que nos divide, el respeto para la negociación colectiva. El documento de consulta lanzada por la Comisión Europea, conjuntamente con la hoja de ruta para la Europa Social, claramente establece que ninguna acción europea posible en el campo de los salarios mínimos ha de buscar la armonización directa del nivel de salarios mínimos en la Unión Europea. Deberán respetar las tradiciones nacionales, la autonomía de los interlocutores sociales y la libertad de la negociación colectiva. La preocupación de algunos de nuestros eh, colegas dentro del grupo, colegas eh, de, de países donde tienen esta tradición fuerte de la negociación colectiva, es comprensible. Y yo creo que aquí tenemos que hacer entre todos, unos y otros, un ejercicio de empatía importante para entendernos aquellos puntos en los que tenemos más dificultades en entendernos, también para conseguir eh, salir de, ese, de esa dificultad para encontrar las posiciones comunes. Eh, como digo, estamos trabajando para que se aseguren las provisiones que aseguren un salario mínimo legal que no se aplique a aquellos sistemas donde el salario se establece a través de la negociación colectiva. Aquí no se trata de buscar el mínimo común denominador, sino de elevar a los que se encuentran en una situación peor. 
Eh, y es lo que tenemos que intentar, no hacer incompatible una cuestión con la otra y pensar sobre todo en aquellos que tienen más dificultades en estos momentos y no tienen en esos sistemas fuertes de negociación colectiva que son los que hacen posible la garantía de estos salarios dignos. Y en estos momentos yo creo y estoy convencida de que es posible y es compatible buscar ese espacio, ese espacio común. Estoy segura de que, de que lo haremos, eh, pero también quiero recordar que el salario mínimo europeo es una de las herramientas más importantes y necesarias para acabar con la precariedad de los trabajadores pobres y devolverles la dignidad. Esta propuesta deberá, además, complementarse con otras que ya hemos reclamado, como digo, no es únicamente esta cuestión. Y para eso estamos en, en esta sala, para eso estamos en este debate, en un debate que hoy se inicia, pero que hoy no finaliza, eh, que hoy quiere ser eh, el pistoletazo de salida eh, de un trabajo que, como digo, tenemos que hacer de forma conjunta, tenemos una responsabilidad importante eh, y yo creo que debemos eh, ser conscientes eh, que la ciudadanía está esperando por más y mejor Europa y que claramente somos los responsables de conseguir eh, esto si somos capaces de entender que después del trabajo y del compromiso vienen las medidas reales que son las que pueden hacer cambiar la sociedad. En ese camino nos encontraremos. Quiero pediros eh, disculpas, no puedo estar durante, durante el evento porque tengo ahora mismo otras reuniones en la agenda, eh, pero estoy en coordinación absoluta tanto con Agnes como Helen en este, en este tema, eh, que, como os digo, es una prioridad para nuestro grupo político y también, sin duda alguna, con nuestro querido amigo, y compañero y comisario Nicolás Smith, con el cual eh, comenzaremos ahora una labor importante en este sentido. Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias a todos. Thank you, uh, Iroxa, for taking time in your uh, busy schedule. I know you have to uh, go, but it's much appreciated that you were here at the start of our uh, meeting because I think it's indeed clear that throughout Europe um, uh, there are trends which affect lots of people at work. Uh, um, um, uh, already mentioned by Eraksa, real wages are lagging behind. The coverage of collective agreements is slowly, slowly decreasing, and in work poverty is on the rise. And that's not a picture where we should take pride uh, in. Um, uh, throughout Europe, we see indeed that the number of uh, atypical jobs are growing. In my own country, the Netherlands, uh, 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 at this moment, already three out of eight people working are where people working in flexible jobs uh, and that amount is growing instead of uh, decreasing um, next to that I think it's already clear that we used to work from the assumption that if the pie was growing eventually everyone was getting a bigger part of the pie eh? that was the normal economic theory a trickling down uh, 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 notion and that it was only a matter of time where East and West should move in the same upwards convergence direction. Uh, and I think uh, in this moment of time it's clear that if we don't do anything, inequality is rising. Uh, uh, one of the instruments to address these issues is indeed the European minimum wage. Uh, I think progressive governments in, for instance, Portugal and Spain are guiding us the way in raising the minimum wage uh, as a way of giving people a better and more decent uh, uh, living. And I'm, I'm uh, uh, for instance, myself totally uh, uh, convinced that if the wage level in Bulgaria is going to rise, all our labor markets are going to profit from that because our labor markets are interlinked. Uh, and therefore, at the start of the debate, I'm, I'm very happy Nicolas is here. Uh, uh, he's going to address us. Uh, uh, and uh, if uh, we all behave very nicely, we also have some time for Q&A. Uh, um, uh, but I think at the start of the debate, when we are clear what we want to reach more equality, uh, 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 a better and fair working conditions for all workers in Europe. Uh, uh, let's work on this proposal around the uh, European minimum 
uh, wage and uh, uh, let uh, all support Nicolas as our commissioner in his support. So uh, can I please ask him to take the floor uh, and uh, uh, give his keynote uh, and then we have later on some time for Q&As. Nicolas. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So I will start in French and then switch to English because now we have to have uh, linguistic uh, diversity. So first, uh, merci beaucoup uh, uh, Agnès, merci beaucoup aussi Erach et, et Hélène uh, pour m'avoir invité mais surtout aussi pour avoir organisé uh, ce séminaire. Je crois que déjà la présence montre qu'il y a un grand intérêt euh, à ce, cette question du salaire minimum et euh, c'est aussi euh, l'endroit où il faut discuter du salaire et je dis bien des salaires d'abord parce qu'il faut peut-être pas réduire la question juste au salaire minimum c'est la question en général des salaires y compris du salaire minimum donc je crois que c'est un peu notre euh, ADN de discuter de justice et de discuter aussi de justice à travers les salaires. D'ailleurs, dès 2016, notre groupe a fait avancer la proposition d'un socle européen des droits sociaux dans lequel, et je crois que c'est le principe numéro 6, se trouve la notion de salaire dit plancher. Et dans ce principe numéro 6, d'ailleurs, c'est clairement exprimé qu'il y a deux voies pour les salaires, y compris les salaires minimums, c'est ou bien la négociation collective, si elle le permet, si elle est suffisamment large, ou bien, si tel n'est pas le cas, ce qui est regrettable, c'est euh, la fixation d'un salaire minimum, comme on appelle ça un salaire statutaire. Et donc, euh, ceux qui se demandent aujourd'hui pourquoi, en mettant d'empressement de vouloir mettre en œuvre ce principe, c'est parce que nous, on prend le socle des droits sérieux, des droits sociaux au sérieux. Nous, on a toujours demandé un plan d'action pour mettre en œuvre le socle. Eh bien, nous mettons en œuvre le socle à travers euh, cette euh, proposition sur les salaires minimums. D'abord, je crois que euh, l'idée que les salaires doivent être décents, c'est aussi quelque chose qui est, euh, ça devrait être en fait partagé par tous. Hélas, nous voyons que euh, en Europe, à peu près 10% des salariés, des travailleurs, n'ont pas des salaires décents, puisque sont affectés, sont concernés par ce qu'on appelle la pauvreté, et in work poverty, ceux qui travaillent et pour autant sont pauvres. Alors nous ne pouvons pas accepter que quelqu'un qui travaille souvent 40 heures, souvent moins parce que, non pas parce qu'il l'a choisi, mais parce qu'il y est obligé, euh, ne gagne pas un salaire décent. Et donc, euh, cela a été dit précédemment, nous devons aborder aussi ce problème de la précarisation, du précariat, de la précarité de travailleurs, souvent d'ailleurs dans des formes de travail dites euh, euh, non euh, conventionnelles et qui souvent, bien sûr, souffrent aussi de salaires extrêmement euh, bas. Donc c'est une question d'abord de justice sociale, de lutter contre la pauvreté, mais cela, via, euh, ça, euh, cela va au-delà. Et donc euh, il faut aussi regarder la question des salaires minimums dans un contexte euh, économique. Et j'en euh, dirai un mot. Défendre des salaires décents en Europe, c'est précisément défendre aussi une approche économique. Et tu l'as dit, on nous avait annoncé la convergence automatique, que les marchés, que les marchés du travail allaient auto automatiquement nous rapprocher euh, et les salaires et donc les conditions sociales. Ben, je donnerai un exemple là où les marchés n'ont pas fonctionner, c'est bien l'écart entre hommes et femmes. On aurait pu dire, bah, les marchés, très vite, vont créer de la convergence 
entre les salaires des hommes et des femmes. Est-ce que cela est arrivé Non, cela n'est pas arrivé, puisque nous sommes encore dans une situation où les écarts de salaire entre les hommes et les femmes, en moyenne, en, en, en moyenne euh, est de 16%. Donc, les marchés ne font pas automatiquement de la convergence. Donc, s'il n'y a pas euh, des règles, des interventions, bien, on peut peut-être attendre encore 50 ans, 100 ans pour les femmes. À ce rythme, ce sera plus de 100 ans que ces écarts se réduisent. Donc, je crois qu'il y a un besoin évident de règles. Et d'ailleurs, s'il n'y avait pas de salaire minimum dans les pays où il existe un salaire minimum, nous l'avons vu dans un certain nombre de pays, eh bien, on, a, on est à des niveaux de salaire qui ne permettent pas de vivre dignement. Là aussi, les marchés du travail, théoriquement, doivent se, 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 se régler automatiquement. Ils ne le font pas, puisqu'ils créent des salaires de très bas niveau qui euh, créent euh, effectivement de la pauvreté. Et donc, il euh, y a euh, un argument économique, par ailleurs, qui... Euh, euh, se manifeste à travers les fuites de cerveau. Quand les jeunes, dans les pays où les salaires sont extrêmement bas, euh, voient que leurs perspectives de vie euh, euh, sont telles que, finalement, euh, ils n'ont aucun, aucune raison de rester, eh bien, il faut un choix. Et le choix, c'est de partir. Et d'ailleurs, nous, so nous, nous sommes, la Commission est allée il y a quelques il y a quelques semaines, en Croatie, et le point central des Croates, ce n'était pas que la Commission songe à introduire des règles sur le salaire minimum, mais leur principal problème, c'est la fuite des cerveaux. C'est la fuite d'une géné génération, voire de générations successives. Et d'ailleurs, on le voit, 3 millions de Roumains qui ont quitté le pays, euh, pas fondamentalement, une situation pas fondamentalement différente en Bulgarie. 25% des personnes qui quittent leur pays sont des personnes hautement qualifiées. Alors on me dit, alors les hautement qualifiés, ils ne vivent pas sur le salaire minimum. Souvent oui, puisqu'ils travaillent dans des secteurs où ils ne gagnent pas beaucoup plus que le salaire minimum. Mais il y a un autre argument. Si le salaire minimum est très bas, les salaires sont très bas. Il y a donc une relation entre le salaire minimum et la structure générale des salaires. Et d'ailleurs, on ne veut pas uniquement intervenir sur le salaire minimum, on espère qu'en en, en poussant le salaire minimum vers le haut, on va pousser toute la structure des salaires vers le haut. D'ailleurs, le meilleur exemple, le meilleur exemple, c'est euh, le, le critère de pauvreté, les fameux 60% du salaire médian. Paradoxalement, et c'est peut-être pas un paradoxe, mais apparemment paradoxalement, le pays qui est le plus proche, qui est proche des 60%, c'est le pays où le salaire minimum est le plus bas. Ben, ça nous dit quoi Pas que c'est dans ce pays-là, les gens ne sont pas pauvres avec le salaire minimum de 278 euros, mais simplement que les salaires en général, sont extrêmement bas. Et donc, il y a une approche globale qu'il faut avoir quand on parle de salaire minimum. Ça va au-delà même du salaire minimum tout seul. Donc, euh, qu'est-ce qu'on propose Pourquoi est-ce qu'on le propose nous, nous le proposons, A, bien sûr, pour lutter contre la pauvreté, B, parce que nous pensons, par ailleurs, qu'on ne peut pas construire une économie dynamique innovatrice, qui investit dans le progrès technologique sur des salaires très bas. Donc, il y a aussi cet argument économique qui est euh, important. Parce que quand les salaires sont extrêmement faibles, bon, il y a peu d'intérêt de, de la part des entreprises à beaucoup investir dans l'innovation, dans les nouveaux procédés technologiques. Ce qui a comme conséquence, par ailleurs, que le gap, que la convergence économique va être ralenti. Donc, au lieu d'avoir plus de convergence économique grâce à la productivité, puisque la convergence économique doit se faire à travers la productivité, eh bien, c'est le contraire. On va euh, garder le grand écart entre les pays à bas salaire 
et les pays qui ont beaucoup ou qui investissent beaucoup dans l'innovation et où, bien sûr, par, euh, par, la, euh, par conséquent, les salaires sont plus, sont plus élevés. Alors, il y a un troisième argument, cela a été dit, c'est que on ne peut pas construire un espace économique et social avec des divergences tellement importantes. Alors, le sal les salaires minima, si je prends que les salaires minima, c'est un écart de 1 à 6, voire de 1 à 7. Ben, Est-ce que les productivités en Europe ont un écart de 1 à 7 Non, si on regarde les productivités globales des facteurs en Europe, c'est un écart de 1 à 3. Donc, on voit bien qu'il y a quelque part un décalage dans certains pays entre le niveau de productivité d'un côté et le niveau de salaire. Donc, il y a un besoin, effectivement, de réduire cet écart de salaire pour le rapprocher des écarts de productivité. Alors, bien sûr, il n'y a pas question maintenant pour dire, oui, il y aura un salaire minimum en Europe ou on va aller vers un salaire minimum en Europe. Nous ne l'avons jamais demandé et nous sommes suffisamment réalistes pour savoir que cela ne se fera pas dans un avenir extrêmement proche. Mais ce qu'il faut, c'est réduire les écarts, donc créer effectivement, euh, effectivement les instruments pour euh, réduire les écarts. Mais si nous parlons de salaire minimum, nous devons absolument parler aussi de l'autre manière pour fixer les salaires. Les salaires. Et donc, c'est les négociations collectives. Dans le programme annoncé par Madame von der Leyen, elle a beaucoup insisté sur l'idée d'économie sociale de marché. Et D'ailleurs, elle a insisté parce que c'est déjà dans le traité. On l'avait un peu négligé, on l'avait un peu perdu de vue, cette économie sociale de marché. On aimait beaucoup parler d'économie de marché, mais on avait oublié L'économie sociale de marché. Bien, dans une économie sociale de marché, effectivement, le meilleur moyen pour fixer les salaires, ce n'est peut-être pas le salaire minimum. Le salaire minimum, c'est toujours ce qu'on appelle un « second best une », deux, une deuxième option. Mais c'est un système de négociation collectif fort. Et donc, si on plaide pour un salaire minimum, on plaide avant tout aussi pour un système de négociation collective fort. Et donc, je, je, pour que nos amis euh, euh, qui ont de tels systèmes me comprennent encore mieux, je vais passer à l'anglais. So, we are not thinking about an e one EU minimum wage. I have already said that. Having fair, adequate wages and wages increases in a certain number of countries where they are low would, however, bring in a new dynamic. C'est ce que j'ai dit. Il faut que, à travers le salaire minimum, on lève euh, la structure générale des salaires. And I have been saying it continuously since the start of our mandate. The Commission is not seeking to undermine, destroy or alter the collective bargaining system which exists in certain countries, whereby social partners participate directly to wage setting. I said it in Sweden, I said it in Denmark, I said it uh, 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 last week, in, uh, uh, close to, uh, near Copenhagen, to the Prime Ministers of uh, Sweden and Denmark, that uh, we are, and in presence of parties and in presence also of tra tra uh, uh, trade union representatives, we want really to protect and we want even to promote the collective bargaining system, which is not so easy, I admit, but we want to promote it where it is too weak or uh, very weak. So it is not our intention because we respect national traditions and we believe in the key role played by social dialogue and collective bargaining in a social market economy. And it is not our intention because countries with a higher collective bargaining coverage tend to have a lower proportion of low paid workers. Calling into question the collective bargaining system would defeat the purpose of our in initiative on fair and better wages. The collective bargaining system must be respected, protected, and promoted. In fact, I would rather extend the collective bargaining system than calling for minimum wages. In countries having collectively agreed wages, workers are better covered and more protected. And we have a few countries in Europe where this 
threshold is above 70, 75, 80 percent. Where this is the case, well, it is very clear we should not oblige these countries to introduce some kind of statutory minimum wage. And this should be made very clear, and there should be legal guarantees to do so. Legal guarantees. Not ju just promises from a commissioner, because commissioners go, they come and go. No, there should be legal provisions to guarantee that in those countries where the threshold is high, there should be no such obligation. So, in countries having statutory minimum wages, social partners are not consulted enough in many cases, not in all, but in some cases. And therefore, essential information sh is not taken on board. This may result in minimum wages changes having negative effects for workers and companies. So we want also to, to, to make sure that social partners are involved in the setting of statutory uh, minimum wages. So we have collective bargaining, but we have also to involve uh, we have to involve social partners in the systems where uh, uh, statutory uh, minimum wages are defined. We have to invest more on capacity building on both the unions and the employer sides, and the Commission has some means to do so, but I would invite especially also the trade unions to do so, to invest a lot into helping uh, the trade unions in those countries where they are weak or too weak to have good collective bargaining. But there is one other remark I wanted to make. It is really difficult to understand, or perhaps not so difficult, that companies who apply collective bargaining in their home country, because this is the normal system, to have collective bargaining there, once they are out of their home country and they are in a different setting in Europe, I do not speak out of Europe, in the European Union, then they do their utmost to avoid collective bargaining. And this is something we really have to change. I said it, by the way, to a powerful employers association yesterday, that they always say, well, let us uh, define uh, uh, the wages. And I agree, if there is collective bargaining, it's the better way. But once outside their homeland, they try to avoid collective bargaining. So really, we have to push also the companies to apply and uh, to com comply with the principle of, uh, um, of collective bargaining. So I think the debate we have to have, and we have to launch in Europe, and this has already been done by ETUC, is, well, it's time for higher or better wages. And through that, certainly, it's time also for better minimum wages. And uh, this is finally our initiative. And this is also something really people in many parts in, in Europe are interested in. And those who have better wages, they understand that in a union, in a market, where people and goods circulate freely, very low standards, social standards, very low wages, are not only bad for those living in those countries with low wages, but at the end they become also bad for those with higher wages. And they will really create a pressure on these higher wages. So in order to have a better balanced Europe, socially better balance, but also economically better balance, we really have to work on this instrument of minimum wages and on an instrument also to promote collective bargaining. And therefore, I hope that we can find a good agreement with everybody in the Union, all those, all the, uh, also zo those who are more skeptical and who fear that some measure or some European directive could harm their system. I say, no, such a system would not harm you, uh, such a directive would not harm your system. Such a directive could better protect your system. This is the issue. What can we do to protect your system? Because the attacks against the, the collective bargaining system could come 
even if we have no directive. So what we want to do is to have a, a directive or a legal instrument which not only pushes low wages up, but also protects and promotes the collective bargaining system. So this is what we have to do, and I think that, and I hope very firmly, that we can have a good agreement on that. Uh, I am ready to discuss hours and days and weeks on it with the aim at the end that our family stays united because this is a key issue. It's a key issue not only for our parties, for our family, political family, it's also a key issue for Europe because people look at that when you talk about wages. People are interested when you talk about their personal situation. And we have to deliver on that and we have to give them the confidence that what we promised, we will do it. Thank you. We have <coughs> uh, uh, indeed hours, weeks and months. I don't think we have years huh? because that's, this is uh, uh, for me with my uh, um, Getting older, I'm getting more, like, it has to be known now. Huh? <laughs> uh, so it, it's, I'm not getting more patience, but uh, I, I think, uh, thank you very much, Nicolas, for this, this clear keynote. Uh, uh, I hope you have some time for yes. Q&A. Uh, uh, and I saw someone uh, in the European Parliament who knows how the system works. So uh, Marianne Vint put her name on the list first, but... I will look around and can I take perhaps I, I a first round of three questions? Are there other people who want to pose a question, Victor? Uh, and Elisabetta. So this is the first round, Marianne, Victor and Elisabetta. I think maybe I wait to after the panel, maybe I get the answer. Okay. Uh, then Victor, uh, newly uh, back in the European Parliament because of Brexit. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, dear Commissioner. A very uh, nice intervention. And of course, I have to mention that also here, also in my country, in Romania, we are supporting uh, the European minimum wage. You mentioned the three million people that left the country. And we also think this is one of the reasons. This is why we recently launched also a campaign, uh, raising signatures for it. We launched it three weeks ago with the trade unions in Romania. When we, have, when we have already thousands of signatures, so people are really interested in that. So my question to you to, is, how do we convince the big corporations, the big companies across Europe to accept that they have to increase the salaries across Europe and that also, let's say, in Eastern Europe, where maybe the negotiations with the trade unions is not happening fairly, um, that they have to do that also in our region. And of course, uh, if you have any recommendations, please advise us on that because you have our full support and knowing that we just succeeded our motion of censorship against the government just now, probably we'll move away from the conservative government and come back with the left-wing government promoting the European minimum wage. Okay, thank you. Victor, and then afterwards, uh, Johan. Yeah, Elisabetta. Commissaire, je particulièrement apprécié la, la mixité de votre présentation, mais je vais parler en anglais moi aussi. Uh, so I really appreciated your presentation. I was very much touched uh, by the relationship uh, you mentioned uh, between, uh, you know, the general structure of wages uh, and uh, the level of uh, minimum wage. So if wages uh, and the minimum wage is low, the entire structure of uh, salaries, uh, uh, of course, in a way becomes uh, low in itself. So I uh, really, it was very important when you said uh, our aim as uh, the new commission is the one to high up uh, to level, but uh, uh, towards uh, a higher level, you know, all the wages. Uh, I just would like uh, to ask you, if you can uh, even better precise uh, uh, the way we can uh, give uh, legal uh, protection to the, con to the collective bargaining system, because this is not very clear. It seems a paradox in itself, because you said uh, uh, in countries uh, where 
the system of collective bargaining is very much uh, uh, institutionalized, uh, actually we do not need a, a legal, a statutory uh, minimum wage. But uh, on the other way, we can give protection, we can receive and give a legal value to that system. But in practice, what does this mean? Okay, thank you. I'm now uh, uh, giving the floor to Johan Danielson and then looking around, uh, uh, I'm, I'm seeing another colleague. Uh, perhaps for everyone who is not a colleague of mine in the European Parliament and still wants to speak, please, uh, if I give you the, the floor, introduce yourself. Uh, uh, but Johan, I'm going to introduce you by saying you're an uh, MEP from Sweden. Johan. Well. <laughs> now perhaps the question is anticipated, but I will try to, to, to surprise somewhat and also thank you Nicholas for your intervention and, and uh, I have uh, put several of the questions to you before so I will not try to repeat myself because of course we are one of the countries where the trade unions themselves are afraid that I directive would force us to at least make our collective agreement generally applicable. So in that sense, I could echo the question that was just raised about how these legal guarantees would be, would be outlined more in detail. But then another question concerning the possibility to enhance collective bargaining. Because, I mean, as you said, if, we, if you just focus on the minimum wage and then also on the 60%, it will not help convergence. If you, if you look on your own annexed to your own uh, consultation, you see that in some of the countries like Bulgaria that was mentioned, you will have a very slight increase in the wages, but in countries like Belgium, Germany, you will have a quite large increase, eh, which will not lead to conversion, perhaps even, even the opposite. And also you have other countries where a large amount of workers are stuck on the minimum wage, which does not help the economy. Minimum wage should be the, the floor, eh? and then people should actually be able to work on higher wages. That's the way the economy works. So, in essence, if this is going to do and create all the benefits that you say, we really need the other leg to work as well, the collective bargaining, so that we get people to work on living wages, on good wages, that you have sectoral collective bargaining that works. And then the question is, more concretely, how do you foresee that the Commission can contribute also in this, this field of the debate, so to say? Thank you. Uh, first, Gabi, and then uh, uh, Lina, and I saw Crystal. Gabi, MEP from Germany. Ja, Nicolas, vielen Dank für dein uh, Plädoyer, hier wirklich eine gute Einigung zu finden. Und ich glaube, Einigung ist das gute Wort, wenn es um diese Doppelstrategie geht, die du beschrieben hast. Und ich denke, ich glaube, alle im Raum wissen, dass wenn man mit europäischer Politik, wie das in den letzten Jahren geschehen ist, Löhne drücken kann und Tarifpolitik schwächen, indem man sie dezentralisiert, dann hat man auch die Kompetenz, Löhne zu Tarifpolitik zu stärken durch starke, auch zentralisierte Tarifpolitik und eben durch gute Mindestlöhne. Aber meine Frage ist jetzt so ein bisschen, ähm, wie auch bei der Frage, die du angesprochen hast, wie ein bisschen konkreter kann so eine Doppelstrategie äh, dann in der Praxis aussehen? Das wäre schön, wenn es da schon Ideen gibt, wenn du die ein bisschen skizzieren könntest. Lina. You want to know my secrets. Well, thank you. <laughs> Everyone thank wants you. to know yeah. your secrets, yes. Um, from the uh, MEP from Spain. Um, well, thank you very much for, for your speech. I, I, I guess the, the most um, probably important part is we promised and we will do it. I mean, I really love it, this, this end of your, your speech. Um, in, uh, in Spain, we have been raising the, our minimum wage in the last two years. And um, recently, in this uh, January, we, we raised to 950 euros. Um, a 31 percent, 5.5 percent increase, uh, 31 euros, and uh, the um, the whole country is on fire. I will say, I mean, there are all the business uh, uh, organizations, especially agriculture one, and because we have a s small rise in unemployment in uh, in during this uh, month. They are saying that it's obviously because of that rise in minimum wage. So 
this more uh, more than a question is uh, uh, is asking to 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 move fast as possible on that to have all the European Union uh, push for uh, you know member states that are trying really to 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 rise uh, the minimum wage, but it's been very very hard to do it uh, because you know all this uh, uh, business organization, the media, and everything is really confronting that measure that we, we really needed in, in Spain because we have a very, very low uh, minimum wage. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, Crystal, and then perhaps uh, Nicolas giving uh, uh, some answers. Crystal? Thank you very much, so, yes. uh, Nicholas. I have no doubt about your intentions. I, I really believe in you that you will try to find a system where you can balance between the collective agreement countries and the others. However, uh, I think it is interesting that you said that you wanted to create a legal guarantee even when you are not in the hot seat any longer. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more about that? How will you be able to foresee judges of the European Court of Justice in the future. I hope you can, but I would like to hear what your thoughts are about this. Thank you very much. Okay. Nicolas, a long list of questions. Uh, yes. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. Um, just perhaps I'm starting with this issue on employment and minimum wages. Huh? There's a bunch full of literature on that. And uh, most, and there is no conclusion, but you, pra practice shows that there is no major uh, negative impact on employment by introducing or uh, increasing the minimum wage. There are also uh, studies who show that an increase in minimum wage may have a positive uh, impact on, on employment. So let us not be fooled by this theory by who say, well, you want to increase minimum wage, you will produce massive unemployment. This hasn't happened. Nowhere. Even not in the US, by the way. So, on this legal guarantee, I think, uh, first I would say that the, 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 the causes of these fears, which I fully understand, I understand the fears. It's not something I would just uh, disregard. So I understand the fears. But we have to look at why this happened with uh, uh, Viking and all that. It's not because there was some directive saying this or that. It was the absence of any provision, social provision. Therefore, by the way, I, I advocate some kind of social protocol making the right balance between uh, social and economic and free, free movement. That, that's lacking somewhere in the treaties. And uh, the trade unions, by the way, also the Nordic trade unions have advocated and, and asked for that. And what, we, what I think would be possible is to have a clear-cut provision saying if you have a well-functioning a uh, collective bargaining system reaching a certain level of coverage, national coverage, to be clear, because otherwise we will be, uh, 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 we will be lost in, in details, uh, national coverage, then this should apply as the system and there should be no obligation to introduce whatsoever a, a, a minimum wage. Now, I think the, the Court of Justice is very powerful and their power is bigger when there is no provision, when texts are not clear. Then they can, and that's their job at the end, give their interpretation. But if the texts are very clear, well, then they have also to apply the text. So I think this is a, a major issue. If the text is clear, when we say, well, we consider that there are two systems, or even three in some way. There's the system, collective bargaining at a high level. There is the mixed system of collective bargaining and statutory minimum wage. And there is a system where collective bargaining is very low and, uh, and, and statutory minimum wages uh, cover more or less uh, the rest. 
uh, well, and we distinguish this system and we say clearly that in those countries where the lef level is very high, 70, 75 percent, that's something we can discuss, mm -hmm. then there is clearly no obligation to introduce uh, a statutory minimum wage and this system should be preserved and protected. This is, by the way, what the pillar of social rights says. This is more or less what the pillar says. So I think this is in very, very general terms what I have in mind, but I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a legal expert. I will ask all the lawyers possible to draft that in a very precise way. Now, on, uh, how can we promote collective bargaining? This is a nasty question. <laughs> no, clearly. The Commission cannot dictate collective bargaining. Collective bargaining is a result in countries between uh, 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 rapport de force between unions and employers. It's a tradition, uh, but it's also a tradition which can be weakened, by the way. We have countries where this very strong tradition has been weakened, and one day the unions who always refused a minimum wage asked for one. Big country, I don't remember the name. <laughs> so, what can we do? Well, first, I think we have no legal instrument to do so. Because, by the way, it's the autonomy of, of, uh, of uh, social partners to do that. But what we can do is, what I said, we can help by uh, those countries where the structures, where the part social partners are weak, we can, together with employers' organization, together with uh, unions, with some European funding, help to build up this uh, kind of social dialogue and collective negotiations. Yesterday, one big uh, association of employers, they even uh, made a tweet on that, say, we are pleading for a higher and stronger social, a role of social partners. Well, I take them by their words and say, help us to do so. And talk also, and that's my other argument, talk to your member companies that when they are in other countries that they are negotiating uh, on uh, collective agreements and not saying, no, here we are safe, we need not have collective agreements. So this has to be something which we promote all over Europe. We cannot have a legal instrument, but we can have recommendations to the member states because in member states it's a bit different. Government, governments in member states can put some pressure, can organize the system in a way where collective bargaining, collective agreements are more favorable. By the way, it was said, well, in the past, there was recommendation to dissolve collective bargaining or to weaken collective bargaining, to go from sectors to enterprises, to companies. Now we should have recommendations to member states saying the contrary. We want, and by the way, it's not something which comes only from the trade unions. Even the OECD, even the OECD has changed totally the language on that because now they are pleading very clearly for co first collective bargaining and second for more sectoral collective bargaining. So the idea we have to decentralize everything, it's not anymore uh, supported even by an organization like the OECD because there are economic reasons to, uh, for saying that finally more general, more sectoral collective agreements have uh, make economically absolutely uh, sense. My last, uh, I think I've more or less... Uh, well, uh, what, what we, I, I have responded to my ideas. What we can do is how we promote collect, uh, statutory minimum wages. We need some good indicators, and there is not one only. The 60% cannot be the only indicator for statutory minimum wages, because I've said, well, then some countries say, well, fine for us, because we have achieved already that. So we have to be a bit more complicated and a bit more, uh, have a larger view when we talk about indicators. Uh, we are about to study that, and uh, next time when I come, I give you more information on that. But um, 
So, um, uh, uh, it's the two-track approach, collective bargaining on one hand, statutory minimum wage on the other. Uh, convergence, what was that? You're asking about minimum wage and helping convergence. Yeah. Well, minimum wages, if they are well organized, they help convergence. Obviously, convergence, in, first they lift overall the structure of salaries, of, of wages, and they normally should also help to, uh, to reduce the gaps. By the way, because who is, who is suffering the most from low win minimum wages? Very, oft, very often women, because the majority of those who, t who take minimum wage are women. So it's also part of that debate on, uh, on uh, gender, gender gaps, uh, because uh, those who, who take the minimum wages are in majority uh, women. So more or less, I think uh, this is what you have asked me and what I can answer, let's say, like that. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you for uh, this phase of the debate. <clears throat> we have now two uh, rounds uh, uh, of specialists and also opportunities for Q&A. But I'd like to ask you to give a big hand of applause to Nicolas Smith for <laughs> being here. And being open-minded for the questions. So thank you, Niklas. And thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to change the scenery here. No. No. He's, he's leaving. This is mine. But do you have some more water? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay. Are we ready? Yeah. Hmm? Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Because I would now like to open the first out of two panel discussions this afternoon. My name is Helen Fritzson. I'm a MIP from Sweden. I'm also vice president in our S&D group and responsible for the European social, uh, the social pillar and uh, gender equality. I have the honor of sharing the first panel addressing uh, minimum wage in Europe, aspiration, and reality. And I really hope this afternoon will be both interesting and fruitful for all of you. And um, I look forward to listen to all our panelists here today. So um, I will introduce our distinguished guests. We have uh, Christine. Christine Omar Pinter, 
uh, and uh, you are working as a research manager in the working life unit of uh, Eurofond. She works in uh, various fields of uh, industrial relations and working conditions, focusing in particular on pay setting. I read about minimum wages, uh, gender pay transparency, industrial action, and social dialogue. Warmly welcome. And um, I also say welcome to uh, Patrick Belser. You are here as a senior economist, wage specialist at the International Labour Organization, ILO. And um, uh, you is the uh, coordinator of the ILO team, which provides uh, country level support to members on minimum wage and uh, also uh, publishing uh, the ILO Global uh, Wage Report. Uh, I think it's um, an, a yearly report since two two thousand, 2008 or every something. Every two years. It comes every out two out. years, yes. You are also very, very welcome this day. And welcome also to uh, Luca Vicenti, who is the General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, ETUC. And um, as General Secretary, Luca is responsible for guiding and coordinating a TUC policy and addressing important issues to European workers. Warmly welcome. Thank you. And uh, also our guest, Oliver Repke. Uh, you are the president of the Workers' Group uh, of the European Economic and Social Committee, EESC. And you also have your background in um, uh, the Austrian trade unions. So very welcome to us. So um, I hope um, I would now uh, like to open the floor uh, for our guests. And after that, uh, we are open the floor for all uh, you and uh, the audience. We will start to listen to uh, you, Christine. So the, the floor is yours. Welcome. So thank you very much, Chair. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this very interesting workshop. Um, according to our own Eurofound estimates, we saw that around 11% of uh, EU workers um, work uh, on or around or below the statutory minimum wages in those countries that have one. So the immediate effect of any EU minimum wage uh, initiative would c capture roughly uh, 11%. I've been asked to start this session now with um, uh, some information on what minimum wages can do and what they can't do. Um, but the problem is it's not always so straightforward and simple. We need a third box for that. Uh, minimum wages can set the binding wage floor, help prevent that there is a wage race to the bottom, establish a level playing field between companies and they uh, are very good in reducing wage inequalities, especially among the low-paid workers or, or the medium-paid uh, workers. They can help give some bargaining power to uh, the more vulnerable groups of workers, and they can also help to stimulate consumer demand, um, which is particularly important in times of uh, economic downturns. But then there are other things that minimum wages can only do um, in combination with other policies, uh, or they might just be doing that uh, under certain conditions. And this is, um, for instance, contribute to reducing in-work poverty. They have a direct effect, uh, but there are many other uh, policies that need to uh, come into this to help really prevent in-work poverty. They can also help to reduce the gender pay gap, but not on their own. Perhaps increase labor productivity, perhaps promote a bit public health. Uh, they can help to uh, reallocate workers into uh, more higher productive economic activities, which ultimately then stimulates economic growth. Um, and potentially, and hopefully, they help to uh, spill over to the whole uh, wage curve and help lift up the wages uh, of other workers that have higher wages. But that's not necessarily the case, especially when you have weak unions and when you have no collective bargaining, that also the opposite might happen. 
but minimum wages can't do well, they won't reach all of the workers in Europe, especially the self-employed are by definition already excluded from that, but also many of those who are in atypical forms of employment. Um, they potentially can reduce uh, overall employment or working hours or shift um, activities into, into undeclared work. Um, but as the Commissioner has already mentioned, uh, there is really a good and an important bulk of research which shows that yes, it can happen, but overall, uh, on, ag on the aggregate level, we haven't seen um, great negative employment effects. And this is really um, a good, good news, I would argue. Um, the European Commission has just recently, in their consultation document, started to outline which elements of adequacy they consider uh, to be important. And that's uh, the relationship of minimum wages to other wages as a percentage of other wages, the net value after tax and benefits. But then, ultimately, is this take-home pay that workers receive sufficient for them to make a decent living? And that obviously depends on the different prices and the purchasing power, power in the different countries. And I cannot develop on all of these points today, but I wanted to focus on two of them, namely the sufficiency and the relationship to other wages. Uh, if you take our European Working Conditions Survey, uh, here data from 2015, um, we can select those workers who are in low paid uh, earning, uh, low earning households, uh, but who are doing full time work. And we can ask them, how difficult do you find it to make ends meet? And what you see here is that there is a, an enormous range uh, between the countries in Europe. Uh, at the bottom of the scale, you find Sweden, where no, virtually no one said. Uh, among this sample said we have difficulties, whereas on the uh, upper uh, end of the scale we have Greece with 60% of workers in such situation reporting to have difficulties. Uh, now, what is the role for minimum wages in that? And I tried to, here to uh, plot the same data for those countries that have statutory minimum wages and plotted that against um, uh, the relative minimum wages in relation to wages. So is it 40%, 50%, or 60% of, of the average wages, uh, of, the, of the median wages in this case? And um, what you can see here is that you can't see a lot uh, because um, there is no, uh, so from, from, from this picture, there is no such an immediate relationship as the commissioner has already pointed out. So it's very important to look at um, the general wage level in the country and then ultimately uh, what the minimum wage workers get as a net pay and if that level of net pay is then sufficient for them to make a decent living. Uh, and minimum wages on their own, minimum wage policy on their own won't solve that. So how have minimum wages developed over time? Uh, the good news is that uh, in uh, many of uh, the countries with relatively low levels of minimum wages, there has been a return to growth, to increases um, after years of stagnation, t partially even reductions in real terms, and, and now they've uh, started to pick up. Pick up. Also very notable are uh, the most recent increases in Spain, in Slovenia, um, uh, in Greece last year, uh, which together with the fact that um, in real terms in the countries with the highest minimum wages there was not such a substantial growth, together with this fact we do see some, up, some convergence uh, since, since in the past five years. Uh, where's the minimum wage setting going? Uh, well, overall we see that we have a really a great and a good variety of national traditions uh, in the minimum wage setting, but with very different degrees of influence and roles for the social partners. If there has been a noticeable trend over the past two de decades, uh, it is that in countries with statutory minimum wages, increasingly uh, expert commissions are being involved in the process of setting the rates and many of these expert commissions also have foreseen a substantial role for the social partners. 
This is a legacy of the UK, who started with their low pay commission, but it has now been replicated in, in Ireland. The German Mindestlohn Commission um, has been uh, put into place, and we now have uh, Croatia and Greece joining this, and also France has um, in included that. Um, two member states, Italy and Cyprus, who don't have statutory minimum wages at the moment, are considering that, are debating it. Other member states without statutory minimum wages, uh, Scandinavian countries, Austria, have clearly ruled this out. There is no possibility um, and no, no necessity. And this is also uh, what we see in research. It, it, it seems to be working rather well. But we do notice that there is a knowledge gap on who are the non-covered workers and are they also the low-paid workers. So I would see some research potential for that. Now, I'm coming to my takeaway points, uh, and takeaway points beyond the fact that it's complicated. Minimum wage policies, they will not reach all workers. Uh, it's com very important to combine them with other policies, like tax and benefits, uh, employment laws, looking at what active labor market policies can do, and obviously um, in relation to collective bargaining policies. We know for sure that minimum wages across the board and overall have not harmed employment, but we should also not take this for granted. So I would clearly argue for uh, monitoring any increases, any substantial increases uh, in an evidence-informed way and in a neutral way uh, um, to see what effects will it have on working hours, on the, on the workers who should benefit from them and on collective bargaining ultimately. And then finally, of course, it's very important to keep social partners on board um, uh, in this evidence form of setting. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> and then, uh, then we move to our second speaker, Patrick. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today as well. And uh, I have a presentation. I have a PowerPoint presentation as well. I don't know if it can be put on. Uh, the subject of which is the question, what is an adequate minimum wage system? And I want to give you an ILO perspective on this question uh, based on a, a number of key documents that uh, we work on in the ILO. Before starting to go into details of what is an adequate minimum wage system, however, I wanted to recall the fact that the principle of an adequate minimum wage has been reaffirmed in the ILO last year in the context of the adoption of the ILO Centenary Declaration, where it was um, stated that it was very important now to strengthen institutions of work uh, through a number of different ways, including through an adequate minimum wage, either negotiated or statutory. I think we've heard already uh, the, the, the discussion. I mean, I've heard the discussion. I, I can sense that... Uh, there is, a, there is a tension here between how the minimum wages are set. The same discussions are going on in the ILO. There are also different traditions that are being represented in ILO documents. And so the ILO considers that minimum wage can be set in either of these two different ways, statutory or negotiated way. Of course, this is uh, the, the, the work on the minimum wage is not new in the ILO. It's, uh, it's been there from the start. It's in the constitution of the ILO. There is a call for the provision of an adequate living wage. And also in the very important Declaration of Philadelphia from 1944, there is a call for wage policies that ensure a just share of the fruits of progress to all. And here, I think we all agree, mostly through collective bargaining, uh, but also uh, a minimum living wage to all who are employed and who are in need of such protection. We have at a more operational level, we have an ILO convention, number 131, which is really the, the basis on, on which uh, we provide our policy advice. And we have also a minimum wage policy guide, and I have distributed uh, here today some of the summaries of that policy guide, which go into some more details of uh, some of the, of the practices around minimum wage setting. I don't have a great amount of time to go into the details of ratification. Nonetheless, I wanted to share with you the, the fact that we're a little bit disappointed that uh, only 10 European countries have ratified Convention 131, even though most countries would have uh, the, the possibility to ratify because they have a system in place. 
uh, that would allow ratification and um, a slightly bigger number, 15 countries uh, from the European Union have ratified convention number 26, but that one was adopted uh, in the 1920s and has a slightly outdated um, philosophy of minimum wages. So I would invite also uh, you maybe to consider whether ratifying the convention 131 could be an option in your uh, in your deliberations uh, and, uh, and at national level also. So what is an adequate minimum wage system? I think there are six key questions here. How is the minimum wage defined? Who is legally covered? Who sets the minimum wage? What's the process? What is the adequate level? How frequently is the minimum wage adjusted? And what is being done to ensure effective application? And that is an aspect that is often forgotten when uh, we talk about minimum wages. So how is the minimum wage defined? According to the ILO, it's the minimum amount of remuneration that an employer is required to pay wage earners for work performed, which cannot be reduced by a collective agreement or an individual contract, and which has the force of law. And uh, so this definition does cover minimum wages set through collective bargaining, as long as these collective agreements are legally binding. It doesn't mean they need to be extended, but it means they need to be legally binding, which is, which is usually the case. But of course, you can extend the coverage through extension uh, mechanisms. Now, what is included in the definition of the minimum wage? There is no ILO standard that addresses this issue. It's not defined in the ILO standard, but it's very important that it's being defined at the national level or the, 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 the European level, I don't know. Because what we see in reality is that there is a lot of confusion when, when the definition is not very clear. And the confusion on, on the side of the workers, what are they entitled to, on the side of employers, what do they need to pay, but also on the side of the courts, which is what, what actually is compliance. So this uh, is very important to be very clear whether this is an hourly or monthly minimum wage. If it's monthly, it's applied to normal working time. Overtime is extra. But what about all the bonuses, the tips, the allowances? Are they, do they count towards the minimum wage or do they come on top of it? And we've seen that in, in many cases, in many countries, mostly outside of Europe, uh, where it's not well defined, the courts are not really able to say whether there is compliance or not. Who should be covered by the minimum wage? Here our convention calls for uh, a broad scope of application so that especially vulnerable workers should be protected by the existing system of the minimum wage. 90% of ILO member states have a minimum wage system in place, but sometimes it only covers one sector or two sectors. The most frequently excluded groups are very vulnerable groups, domestic workers, workers in agriculture, and what about peace rate workers? We've, we've seen also that in many countries there is, there is confusion about whether people on peace rate are covered or not. So in your deliberation, keep this in mind as well. This is a big group. In some industries, there are very important uh, categories of workers. How should minimum wages be set and operated? Here the key ILO principle, unsurprisingly, is full consultation with social partners and, if possible, the direct participation of the partners on the basis of uh, equality. This can be in minimum wage commissions, this can be in more general uh, tripartite bodies where there is economic and, and social consultation going on. Uh, it can even be separate. The government sometimes can consult workers and employers separately, but, uh, but uh, different modalities are possible. What we, do, what, we, what we don't support is unilateral decisions by, by governments. Independent experts should be involved because we think that evidence and someone, some people representing the general interest uh, are also very important. What's an adequate minimum wage level? This is, of course, uh, an impossible question, uh, uh, I'm tempted to say. It's a very difficult one, at least there's maybe not one ideal level, but there is often a range of, uh, of levels within which a minimum wage uh, fulfills its main social function while also preserving the uh, capacity to pay of enterprises. And so what we call for is a balanced approach, taking into, into account needs of workers and their families, and that's very important. It's not just a single worker 
being able to provide for herself or himself, its needs of workers and their families, because people have dependents. That's the reality of, uh, of, of many people. Uh, and also taking into account economic factors. How to use uh, statistical indicators, we, we, for example, the ratio of the minimum wage to the median wage is very often used. It's a very useful indicator. Uh, we, we support the use of statistical indicator. Uh, as Nicola Schmidt said before, we also support the use of multiple indicators, not just one. And we support these indicators in order to uh, inform the social dialogue on the minimum wage rather than in a mechanical way to use in, in, a, in a formula which is being done in some countries and which tends to weaken the social dialogue around the minimum wage setting. We have a project also going on with the, supported by the, the government of the Netherlands which is trying to look more into details into these methodologies to assess the needs of workers and their families and working also with social partners and ITUC uh, and, and Evelyn who is uh, represented here today. We do believe that uh, the recent evidence shows that when minimum wages are set in a carefully balanced way, they do raise the wages of low-paid workers, very often women, without significant negative effects on jobs. And that's what we have written also in the, in the Global Wage Report. We've heard that from Nicola Schmidt. We, we heard it from Christine as well, and this is also our view. It's very important that the minimum wage system includes a mechanism of review an annual review or every two years. You'd be surprised of the number of countries which uh, set the minimum wage rate once in a while and then forget about it and then adjust it 15 years later. And this includes some large, very large countries, which um, maybe I don't want to name here, but uh, which are not in Europe. <laughs> um, uh, and so it's very important that, that it's being adjusted. There are ways to adjust the minimum wage. Uh, there are ways to define criteria to, to uh, support this discussion on the minimum wage, and the, particularly the evolution of the cost of living and some other criteria. And finally, this is my last point, it's uh, how to promote the effective application of the minimum wage. Well, as we've heard before, including the social partners in the deliberation is is a very important part of this. In addition, the minimum wage should be clearly defined, Ad adequate sanctions uh, should be set up, and then proactive labor inspections, information campaigns are also very important alongside training activities. Our next global wage report, a bit on, of publicity, will be on this subject of the minimum wage, will come out at the end of the year, and uh, we remain at your disposal for any future exchange on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. And we move over to our third speakers. Luca, you will give us the voice from the European Trade Unions. The word is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to attend this that I think is a very timely and important initiative to start a discussion with the legislators about this uh, legislative initiative that uh, Nicola Schmidt has explained about uh, in his uh, speech today. Uh, we are in the middle of the social partners consultation. So this is a very formal process according to the treaties. This means that what I will tell you is not yet an official position of the ETUC. I want to make this very clear uh, because we, have still, we are still uh, in the middle of that discussion uh, within the ETUC constituency and only in a couple of weeks we will be able to reply to the first stage consultation that the Commission has launched uh, mid-January. At the same time, I will try also as much as possible to be clear, sincere and precise in what we think uh, this uh, legislative initiative uh, should look like and why. Uh, let's start from the why uh, and let's very briefly analyze the situation of wages in Europe. We are uh, just coming out from more than a decade of uh, austerity. This austerity has uh, uh, significantly affected the level of wages in most European countries and very often also has affected the functioning and the, and the structure of the minimum wage systems, including collective agreements and collective bargaining structures. 
All these in many, many countries has been completely dismantled because of uh, the semester country-specific recommendations, because of the Troika, unwanted interventions on collective bargaining systems and minimum wage systems in many, many countries. And this has come on the top of 20 years of globalization, financiarization, deregulation, privatization of our public services and of our uh, social dialogue and uh, social market economy institutions. Why I say all that? Because the situation of wages in Europe is dramatic is severe and dramatic. And uh, uh, that's the reason why we welcome the initiative that was announced by Ursula von der Leyen to intervene with some legal instrument to make sure that each and every worker in Europe can benefit from a decent living wage. Uh, if you want, this is a political statement, but it's also a very practical statement, because if we miss the opportunity to address the wage divergence and the wage tragedy that many, many workers are facing in Europe at the moment, well, we will all bear the responsibility of not having taken the right initiatives to try to address this problem. There are three types of uh, divergence uh, that uh, we are facing in labor markets in Europe when it comes to wages. The first one is the divergence that is the most evident and is the divergence between countries. Uh, it was already mentioned by many, I mean, uh, if you take the uh, minimum wage, uh, uh, but also the average wage uh, or the median wage in Bulgaria and in Luxembourg, the ratio is 1 to 8, 1 to 7, more or less. Uh, these are the extreme, but then if you look at the graphs, I mean, no, uh, you can see that unfortunately there are many, many countries that are more close to Bulgaria than to Luxembourg uh, at the moment. And there is no justification, neither in living costs nor in productivity levels, to back a difference like this, 1 to 7, 1 to 8. Uh, Nicola said 1 to 3 for productivity is even less. The ratio is even less. In 1 to 1 1.5, 1 to 2, the, level, the difference in productivity levels uh, when it comes especially to industry sector, uh, sectors if we compare uh, Bulgaria to Luxembourg, for instance. The second level of divergence uh, is about multinational enterprises. They were mentioned by the Bulgarian MEP, uh, Romanian MEP, uh, just, uh, just earlier. Uh, let's take Volkswagen, the most significant, uh, the most significant uh, 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 multinational company, most symbolic, let's say, multinational company uh, that we have in Europe. Uh, first example about Volkswagen. If you take a Volkswagen plant in Western Germany, uh, before the introduction of the minimum wage in Germany, also after the introduction of the minimum wage in Germany, you will see that between a direct employee of Volkswagen in a certain plant, mm -hmm. the one working in the supply chain of that plant of Volkswagen, and the one working in the services in Volkswagen, cleaning services, catering, etc., etc., before the minimum wage was introduced, the ratio was 1 to 8. After the minimum wage was introduced, the ratio is 1 to 5 in the same Volkswagen plant in Western Germany. This is really a problem for European workers. Take then a Volkswagen plant in Western Germany and a Volkswagen plant in Romania. Well, the, uh, the, the ratio for employees of Volkswagen in these two countries will escalate and will probably will be in line more or less with the situation of Bulgaria compared to Luxembourg. And again, there are no justification in terms of the level of living and the level of productivity. Of course, there is a gap, but the gap is not so huge as is now in wages and in wage divergence. And there is a third element of divergence that is, divergence that is between traditional employees, so those that have a working contract, and those that don't have a working contract or that have a non-standard uh, an, an independent or uh, a bogus independent working contract. For these people, of course, there is no coverage of minimum wage in most of the European countries. There is no coverage of collective agreements uh, in most of the European countries. So this is the picture we have in front of us. And if we don't address this picture, as I said, well, we missed to take our responsibility to address the major problem that at the moment uh, the working people are facing in our continent. And the, the only way to address this is to have a significant pay rise uh, 
and a significant tent for wage conversion towards the best uh, in each and every European country. And it's not true, Nicolas already said that, that increasing minimum wages or increasing wages by collective <laughs> agreements uh, will affect employment. All the figures show that it's exactly the contrary. If you increase wages by taking into account living cost and productivity in each and every country, well, on the contrary, you are improving the competitiveness and the capacity of the economy to be resilient uh, in, the long, uh, in the long run. So this is what we want to do. How to do it? Well, uh, it was already said, uh, the Bulgarian minimum wage, if we simply uh, have a directive or a legal initiative that says we have to increase uh, legal minimum wages in all the countries where legal wa minimum wages exist, uh, well, in and we set, for instance, the target of the 60% of the median, this for Bulgaria will mean that since the median wage in Bulgaria is around 3 euros per hour gross amount, and the current minimum wage is more or less 50% of, uh, uh, of this amount, 1.5 euros gross amount per hour, increasing the minimum wage in Bulgaria up to 60% means 30 cents pay rise gross amount per hour. This is something that Bulgarian workers will consider as an insult. That's why we need to have a legislative initiative that addresses at the same time how to make minimum wages higher and better working, but at the same time also how to strengthen collective bargaining institutions, making sure that we can have a collective agreement in each and every sector, in each and every country of the European Union covering all workers. How to do that? Here we enter into technicalities, but you know technicalities are also very political. We think that when it comes to minimum wages, it's exactly what the ILO has just explained. These are, let's say, the targets and the elements that we need to take into account if we want to improve the minimum wage systems where they exist. 60% of the median as a target for convergence, of course, gradual, because there are countries that need more time, I mean, to converge towards this. But we need to make sure that minimum wages cover all workers with no exemptions. We have to make sure that social partners participate in setting the legal minimum wages everywhere in Europe. We have to make sure that minimum wages are compulsory for public procurement. Only doing these four things, I mean, will improve significantly the minimum wage systems in many, many countries. And then we have to introduce, of course, a guarantee that there will be no imposition of a legal minimum wage to those countries where social partners don't want to have a legal minimum wage because their collective bargaining system works enough well to make sure that they can protect their workers in, the, in those countries. But at the same time, we have also to make sure that those countries like Cyprus, where there is not a minimum wage, but the social partners, or at least the trade unions, want a minimum wage to be introduced, this can be done, despite or thanks to this directive. Then we have collective bargaining, and this is the most tricky, difficult issue, of course, because many of you have asked, how can we do it? How can we really make sure that we can improve the situation of collective bargaining? From our point of view, there are three elements to be considered. The first one is that we need to remove the obstacles that in many, many countries, because of legal frameworks, wrong legal frameworks, impede the social partners to develop proper collective bargaining. For instance, introducing the possibility for independent workers to join a union and to engage in collective agreements. Second, the possibility for uh, trade unions to enter the workplaces and to organize workers with, without having uh, obs legal obstacles that prevent the trade unions to organize and to deliver proper collective bargaining. There are many, many obstacles that, let's say, circumvent the ILO conventions uh, and through the national law make sure that the ILO conventions are not accessible in terms of implementation for many, many unions in many, many countries. So first, removing legal and also practical obstacles. Second element, increasing the capacity of social partners to deliver proper agreements, and this means also funding from the European Union, and making sure that if the EU, through the ESF Plus, establishes a certain amount of money for each and every country to support the capacity building of social partners, there is not the Hungarian government that moves this money from the trade unions to the churches and so destroying the capacity of trade unions to deliver collective agreements because there is no money available for them to develop their capacity to, uh, to negotiate. But third, and this is the most critical but most important element, we need legal frameworks. Because, you know, in the countries where collective bargaining works and covers, covers more than 70% of uh, workers, there are 11 countries in this condition at the moment in Europe, well, of course we can help, but they are already 
able on their own, because they have a legal framework that supports collective bargaining, to develop better collective bargaining and better coverage. So there shouldn't be any imposition for these countries to do anything, because they are already managing on their own. I mean, it's what uh, Nicholas Smith said. But for those that are below 70%, without introducing legal frameworks, that make possible for the social partners to deliver proper collective agreements and then for these collective agreements to be legally recognized as compulsory for workers and companies, well, this needs legal frameworks at the national level to support collective bargaining. Of course, we have a problem here. It's not exactly the imposition of a minimum wage, you know. Our Swedish colleagues know that there is no directive that can really impose a legal minimum wage to Sweden. This will be against the treaties. But there could be a directive that could impose an extension of the of the collective agreement to the, Swedish, uh, to the Swedish social partners. And this is what they don't want. And they are right to be very afraid about that. So we need to find ways to uh, help those that need an extension, because this is the only way in those countries to make sure that collective bargaining can be reinforced, by protecting at the same time the Swiss and the Danes in particular, not to have an imposition of a extension erga omnes, by solving the problem of that 10%, 12%, 15% of workers that are not covered by the collective agreements through social dialogue through collective bargaining. There is a very interesting example that happened very recently in Denmark. And this replies also to some questions that I've listened to before. Uh, it's about truck drivers that, that are posted to Denmark uh, for cabotage. So they stay in the country and they continue going around in Denmark uh, to deliver something uh, in the country. They come from Poland, from Lithuania, from Latvia, from Czech Republic, indifferent. So far, these people are not covered from, by the collective agreement. So potentially, there could be a Laval or Viking case for these truck drivers. What the Danish social partners have done is that they have uh, concluded a collective agreement that says if these truck drivers, instead of crossing the country, decide to stay in the country for cabotage, to get the permit to stay, they need to respect the wages established by the collective agreements without a legal extension, but the government says, I respect the collective agreement between social partners, so if a Polish truck driver comes to Denmark and stays here for cabotage, I will release the permit to this person to work only if this person will enjoy uh, the same wage as in the collective agreement. If a thing like that was in place at the time of the Viking or Laval case, uh, probably these cases wouldn't have happened. Because Nicola Schmidt is right. Since there is no regulation about those that are not covered by the collective agreement, and rightly speaking, our colleagues in there don't want a regulation for that, we need to find uh, collective uh, agreements that can really solve the problem without the rules of the single market interfering in our social partners' prerogatives. And I can tell you very clearly, colleagues, this is my personal opinion. I'm not talking about on behalf of the ETUC because the ETUC didn't take a position yet. I'm really convinced that if we can introduce through a legislation at the European level norms like that, that encourage social partners to conclude agreements to fix the problem of the lack of coverage without having legal impositions, we will prevent any future uh, law case on this kind of, or court case on this kind of uh, uh, loopholes that still exist in some very strong systems. That's why we need to explore very well the legal basis for this initiative, and we are convinced that there are very sound legal bases that can really back a good legislative initiative, we need to explore very well all details about content of the kind of uh, legislative initiative that we need, and we need to explore together which is the best uh, legal instrument to make sure that the content we want to achieve can be really achieved and become compulsory to protect the system that work and at the same time uh, encourage those that are lagging behind to reach some better results. We are convinced that this is possible. But then it comes about, I mean, our responsibility to find the right solutions 
and at the same time also then the responsibility of the politics, of the politicians, of the European Commission, of this European Parliament that will have really to help us in delivering something that can really improve the condition of workers uh, uh, all, around, uh, all around Europe. I have attended, I was kindly invited to the Congress of uh, the PS uh, just before the European elections. And I remember very well that Franz Timmermans, uh, when he was, uh, uh, let's say, nominated as the Spitzenkandidat of the PS, Yes, uh, in his uh, final speech in Madrid, uh, he said, the first legislative initiative I want to do if I become president of the Commission will be a directive to have a decent wage and strong collective bargaining for each and every worker in Europe. And the second initiative will be a directive to address the gender pay gap in Europe. Well, then this is exactly what you, the S&D group, has obtained to be included in the first four priorities of the first 100 days of Ursula von der Leyen. So that's why I insist again to conclude we cannot miss this opportunity. This was a great success of all of us. So we, now we have to deliver on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca, and we look forward to listen to our final speaker, Oliver. The word is yours. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Helen, for, for uh, inviting me to this important uh, conference. Uh, it doesn't make it very easy to uh, be uh, being the last speaker here on the panel because I think we have listened to many interesting interventions and uh, facts and figures, and I can say that uh, almost all of this I, I can subscribe. And uh, as you know, I'm here also in my capacity as a future rapporteur um, of a new exploratory opinion, which will be elaborated in the Economic and Social Committee on decent minimum wages across uh, Europe. And after having listened to all the arguments, I'm not sure if we really need another opinion on this issue. But I think there are still, we there's, need it. We need it. I think there are still arguments. And uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, we, uh, even if we agree here on the importance of, uh, of this initiative, unfortunately, uh, this is not shared by, by all stakeholders. So I think uh, this initiative comes really timely and also the discussion today. So thank you very much for this. Please allow me to, to say one word. Uh, again about the social pillar because we as trade unions as you know we were um, parts of us were quite skeptical about the idea including myself uh, about the idea of another legally not binding uh, document on social rights at European level but I think uh, the discussion now and also the proposals and the announcements of Nicola Schmidt two weeks ago or, or three weeks ago about the future action plan show that uh, this initiative was really important and it was the right initiative because it serves not only as a compass, it serves somehow like a social policy agenda for us and I hope so in, in next year or end of the year also as a social action program. And so I'm, I'm really happy about this, that this uh, principles and also the principle six of, the, um, of this social pillar will not remain only a proclamation, but it will become a reality. Because I fully agree with uh, Luca. We said before the elections, we said this is a really essential and social and democratic uh, program and project that all workers should benefit from decent wages uh, in Europe. And now we have this initiative on the table. We don't have it yet, actually, but we have at least a consultation as a first uh, step. And I think uh, we cannot afford that this important initiative will fail. I think this is really our responsibility. We can discuss about different instruments, uh, about uh, different levels where we have to implement and where we have to, to, yeah, to implement uh, this initiative, but we should not, we should not discuss uh, about the principle uh, itself. I think it's our responsibility of all of us, and especially of the trade unions, uh, to, make, uh, to make this a reality. So this was one preliminary remark. Uh, then I, I would like to uh, maybe to, to um, tell you a bit about our project in the Economic and Social Committee because it's true, uh, first of all, it is the responsibility of the social partners. They are now consulted and we will see, uh, they have even the opportunity to enter in negotiations. So the question was, can we provide an added value as Economic and, and Social Committee? And uh, to be honest, uh, 
One of my uh, principles is that we, in our opinion, will definitely not interfere uh, with the social partner consultation. This is clear. Uh, but I think, on the other hand, this exploratory opinion, which was uh, demanded by the European Parliament and especially from the S&D group, and we are really grateful for this, I think this opinion uh, can help. It can help to map the situation in different EU member states, to describe situations there, strong, uh, strong systems where we can learn from, but also shortcomings in, in, other, uh, in, other, in other countries. And we will uh, carry out country visits to different regions, to the Nordic countries, to south southern countries, to Eastern Europe, to see um, how can we map the situation and how can we probably in the end also propose some possible options some possible options uh, for action at European level. I think this is the added value we can provide as Economic and Social Committee because, as you know, this is, will not be a, a workers' group opinion in the end. It will be an opinion of the whole committee, including the employers' group, so it will be a compromise. But uh, uh, I think that uh, we can really contribute to this debate. Why is this in our opinion, in the opinion of the workers' group, uh, so uh, the trade union group in the Economic and Social Committee, why is this a flagship project? And why is, this, uh, why is there really a need for action at European level? And uh, I can, of course, reiterate what has been said before, but uh, let me just mention some points. First of all, I think this is also pointed out in the consultation document of the Commission. In general, wages, not only minimum wages, but wages are too low uh, across the European Union. Maybe not in all countries, but in, in many countries, they are too low. Too low. We see a, a lack of uh, coverage when it comes to minimum wages, also in some countries uh, in collective bargaining. We see that some wages itself too low. In some countries, we see that the involvement of the social partners is not sufficient. So I think there's a need, uh, there's a need for action also at a European level, because it, as it was said before, we had in the recent years uh, several attacks, really attacks against collective bargaining systems, against wage setting systems. I remember um, the former vice president of the European Commission who was in favor of this decentralization of uh, wage uh, setting systems and uh, he said that um, collective bargaining at enterprise level can better reflect productivity uh, levels and I think the other way around is correct. Because if we don't have a certain centralization of collective bargaining, then we can't have uh, an overall wage policy, which is important. So therefore, uh, I think this, this was the wrong way. And therefore, I'm also happy that now the Commission seems to go in the opposite uh, direction. It was said already that uh, in-work poverty is a big problem. One in 10 workers live in households that are at risk of poverty. More than 20 million workers in, in Europe uh, are uh, concerned by this. And as I said, wages have often not followed productivity trends, and this was resulting in a decrease in the wage share uh, in the European Union. And uh, one last uh, figure, it was just uh, sent out by the ETUC, because the ETUC uh, said, and this is right, that in, still in eight countries, workers earn less, in real terms, less than they did 10 years before. 10 years before, they earned more money than today. And I think this is really an alarming uh, sign. And um, if we see the wage gap, especially the east-west wage gap, then it's true that we had some efforts, I think, until 2008. But since 2008, the trend is stagnating. And I, I like always to, to mention our fellow colleague, the president of the Czech uh, Confederation of Trade Unions, Josef Stredula, who said, if the, uh, the trend of wage increase will continue as it did in the last years, then we have to wait another 80 years until we can reach uh, the average of Western European wages. Mm -hmm. And even if it's 60 or 70 years, we don't have 70 years to wait. So I think this is another argument why there is a need for action also at EU level. And I think we should agree about uh, this. And last but not least, uh, we are not talking only about uh, countries with too low minimum wages, with uh, in-work poverty, and uh, with workers who are exploited. 
uh, I think also f coming from a country f uh, like Austria, where we have relatively high wages and a, a very good functioning, very well functioning collective bargaining mm -hmm. system, even we are very interested in higher wages in our neighbor countries, because this enormous wage gap creates a lot of problems, tensions, and it creates, of course, uh, it causes uh, the exploitation of the colleagues of Eastern European uh, countries. Uh, I always mention the example in our construction uh, sector where posted workers, especially from Eastern European countries, uh, get in less than 50% of the cases the collectively agreed wages in Austria. So this means uh, it is rather the rule than the exception that they suffer, that they are deprived from higher wages in, in our countries. And I think this is another argument why we have to work uh, towards upward wage convergence and we have to reduce this enormous wage gap uh, between, between uh, East and West. So if, if it comes to the Commission's, I don't say proposal, but initiative, then I can say that in general, of course, we also as a workers group, we welcome uh, this proposal to strengthen uh, wages uh, in, in Europe. And I think especially, also this has been said, especially women, employees with atyp atypical contracts and the service sector is affected and they would benefit from such a, uh, from such a initiative. Maybe to come to an end, because we are running out of time, a last uh, remark on the legal guarantees, because that was mentioned by Nicola Schmidt, and I know that many of our colleagues, not only from Nordic countries, um, they, of course, they remember the court rulings of the European Court of Justice, and I, I fully understand this. And uh, it's not only the Nordic countries. We had recently another uh, ruling of the European Court of Justice uh, concerning workers, mobile workers, working on trains, uh, operating in Austria, 80% operating in Austria, but they were starting in Budapest, and the catering staff, the personal colleagues from Hungary, they received only the Hungarian minimum wage. And it was not a Hungarian company, it was an Austrian company. So they, they used uh, use these loopholes in order to exploit people, and they, that's their business model, actually. And the problem is that in Austria, this was, uh, this, uh, was illegal, but the European Court of Justice decided against the Austrian law. So we have to be really cautious with this. We need really reliable legal guarantees, not only announcements, because it's not enough. We can see it's not enough to have uh, national legislation, as, we, as some countries have it, if the European Court of Justice then decides in the other way. And therefore, and that's my last word, I think also with regards to the conference on the future of Europe, we need really this social progress protocol in order to end this imbalance between economic freedoms and social rights. We have to make sure that uh, social rights should be at least at the same level uh, like the economic freedoms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oliver. And now we have um, maybe 10 minutes for questions. So, um, and you know, uh, the short questions are always the best <laughs> questions. Um, I think we will start, uh, and I will ask you if you have a question to Christine, because Christine is going to leave for uh, going to the airport. So we start with a question to Christine. Marianne? Thank you. Thank you all of you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, I'm an MEP from Denmark and I'm as a socialist uh, and a unionist, it's my highest priority to tackle in work poverty in Europe. Uh, now, after you have spoken, all of you, we know that minimum wage directive for full-time workers will struggle to cover the rising number of European workers who are engaged in non-standard forms of work. Platform workers today are defined as self-employed rather than employees. We therefore cannot regulate their wages. Moreover, they are blocked by competition policy from organizing and raising prices collectively. More and more are employed on part-time and share our contract. This type of non-standard employment is in massive growth around the Europe and they are the biggest victims of in-work poverty. Christine, you said in, in your speech that minimum wage can't stand alone. It needs to be combined with some other policies. 
can you can you comment on what actions the EU should take to address this complexity of working poor challenge? Very good and difficult question. Um, well, legally speaking, those um, statutory minimum wages, they usually apply to uh, workers in uh, standard forms of employment with a, with a normal working contract. They might be paid pro rata, so those that have zero hours contracts would usually get pro rata their pay, but these hours might not be enough. Yeah? So some countries already have stepped up and uh, made some laws um, which uh, reduce uh, the usage of the zero hours contract. So that's one potential answer to the problem. Ireland, for instance, did that. Or where they made it very, very restrictive. Um, another option is possibly, and I understand that's also a discussion already at European level, is which status the platform workers are given. Are they self-employed or in standard employment? And um, the more, uh, if there is at one point the legal clarity that um, uh, certain forms um, of, of platform work should be regarded as standard forms of employment, then they would be also captured by the minimum wage policies. Then there are other examples, for instance, uh, I a colleague mentioned the peace rate workers, which is rather similar also to what some kind of platform workers do. The Netherlands, for example, have just recently included the peace rate workers into their standard minimum wage policies. So, so that's the third option that I could think about. And to address wage, um, in work poverty in general, obviously that needs to have a, a combination of many other policies as well, like um, which in work benefits people get, uh, extra benefits if, if the wages are uh, too low, looking at the dependence, looking at um, you know what is socially needed for uh, for a work with a family. This is what what uh, member states can do. Then obviously one big factor is the work intensity of the household. So it's a lot about bringing people into work um, and making sure they have the required number of hours. Thank you, Christine. And then I give the word to Elisabetta. I have actually a question for Mr. Vicentini, if I'm allowed to. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak in Italian. Thank you. Um, ho molto apprezzato la sua presentazione, anche la tenacia insomma, politica su, sulla questione che ci ha anche molto caricati come gruppo politico. Siamo fortemente convinti che eh, introdurre una direttiva, lo sottolineo, una misura legislativa, una misura legislativa per la prima volta che si occupi anche in senso largo di povertà salariale, di lavoro dignitoso, eh, sia una svolta di cui l'Unione Europea ha bisogno. Non possiamo parlare di un'Unione, un'Europa più vicina ai cittadini, un'Europa sociale, un'Europa vera senza dei potentissimi simboli ma che sono poi delle cose che toccano la vita dei cittadini e questo lo possiamo fare solo con una direttiva quindi eh, mi fa piacere sapere che insomma con tutti i distinguo possibile mi sembra che la sua confederazione tutto sommato condivida questa impostazione le chiedo però una cosa mi sembra che lei abbia caldeggiato una visione larga del problema e cioè eh, il fatto che non si parli solo del minimo salariale ma di una, una nuova dignità dei lavoratori che passa anche attraverso la promozione dei diritti sindacali nei luoghi di lavoro, la possibilità di associarsi ad un sindacato, la possibilità di avere dei permessi sindacali, tutto ciò che riguarda la democrazia sul lavoro, i diritti sindacali e ancora magari un provvedimento che tocchi anche l'annosa questione della rappresentatività e dell'estensione erga omnes dei contratti collettivi laddove questo non avviene. Ho ben capito, cioè voi caldeggiate quindi una direttiva ampia, di livello generale, in qualche modo trasversale, che non focalizzata. Lo dico perché può essere un'ovvietà, ma in realtà poi diventa ovviamente un atto ancora più generale, forse ancora più complesso da mettere in piedi. 
Thank you, Elisabeth. We take two more questions and then will the panel answer. So you waved. Uh, yes, the word is yours. Please tell us uh, who you are representing. Hi. So um, I'm, my name is Linda Kunertova and I work here at the Parliamentary Research Services. Um, thank you all for your uh, contributions. I mostly agree with many things that were said. I was just wondering because uh, um, uh, on the employment effects, uh, you all agreed on the fact that uh, s there was no significant effect on the aggregate level for, for economies, but I was wondering whether there is, what does the research say about the, uh, yeah, uh, about the employment effects of the bottom, at the bottom of the um, d income distribution? Thank you. Thank you. And then a short question from you, Mrs. Carbon. Thank you very much. Um, oh. Sorry. Uh, and my questions for Luca. Um, you said that um, you see many different possible legal bases uh, for the adoption of an ambitious uh, minimum wage directive. Um, I will be speaking on this topic later, um, but I was wondering whether you can already say if you agree with me that this should then not be the social policy legal basis, which I think the Commission is currently exploring, nor an internal market legal basis, because then you end up with a Viking and Laval, but that instead we should be thinking about social and economic cohesion on the basis of Article 175 TFEU. Thank you very much. And then I give the word to you, Christine, to answer the question and then to Luca. Thank you. This is a very good question. And um, I slipped my presentation. But yes, you are right indeed. If you dig deeper beyond the aggregate, then you do find, and many studies find, that uh, especially the lower skilled workers, those working in uh, smaller companies, in the less productive companies, they might be affected. Yeah? Uh, the effects are all not really great and not very big, not very large. And then the next question is what happens to these workers? Will they be reallocated to more productive activities, to higher paying jobs, to better companies? That's what we want ultimately, I would argue. Um, uh, very well researched recently is the German case, five years after the introduction of the statutory minimum wage, but also the British case uh, where they moved towards 60% uh, of median wages now. Um, and they have found some reductions in working hours. Um, also across the board, but mainly for people who were working full-time and on minimum wages, so not, the, not so much for the student worker who would do a few hours. And then they also found some uh, marginal, uh, some effects on marginal employment on the mini-jobbers, uh, the number of mini-jobbers going down, which um, does seem um, negative, uh, from, you know, if you look at it like that. But then they realized that it was because um, they were um, put into standard employment forms um, uh, just to avoid any legal uncertainty. And so this is uh, also then um, overall a positive effect. And it shows the importance of having this research that goes beyond the aggregate. Thank you very much, Christine. And if you must leave, so thank you for your participating today. <laughs> and then I give the word to Luca to answer the two questions. Thank you. Well, first of all, directive or non-directive, this is the big enormous question. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, we didn't come yet uh, to a clear position, uh, official position, let's say, in the ETUC on this topic. Uh, there is a big discussion going on. Uh, by the way, we have our executive committee tomorrow with all the trade union leaders to discuss uh, in general the initiative and particularly also uh, the legal elements in it. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, uh, if we can achieve the content we want and then guarantees that we want, uh, the directive is the only legal instrument that can allow us uh, to enforce uh, what we have achieved. Uh, 
If, on the contrary, the content of this initiative will be negative, then it's better not to have even a recommendation, because the risk then is to end up in the same kind of horrible recommendations that have been issued for 10 years uh, 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 on, uh, on macroeconomic policies by destroying uh, uh, social services, I mean our welfare state and our collective bargaining uh, system. So it's very important the kind of content we can get at the basis of this initiative and the kind of guarantees. If the content and the guarantees are sound and effective, then the only way to implement this content and these guarantees is to have a, a directive. I would say a framework directive, and it's not a subtle legalistic uh, distinction, because you know a directive prescribes a series of uh, criteria, adequacy, targets, etc. Here we need more uh, targets for convergence, and then, uh, let's say, measures uh, to be chosen according to the different situations that exist in the various countries uh, to implement the principles and the targets that we would like to see uh, uh, enshrined in, uh, uh, in this legal tool. Then, uh, what's the best legal base for that? Uh, I'm not sure I completely agree. Uh, we are working on uh, the working conditions legal base because we think that this is the best legal base to achieve the objectives that we have in mind. But, okay, we are open to uh, discuss. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not the one to discuss with. So I will send you all our, um, uh, let's say, team of lawyers uh, that uh, can, I mean, clarify the different opinions on this, uh, in this respect uh, and uh, find the best, uh, the best approach. We are really scared by any kind of uh, economic governance or single market legal base because we will be back to the horrible middle age uh, of the last 10 years. Uh, let's see uh, what, uh, what, what's the best uh, way to uh, uh, proceed. What is absolutely also to be avoided is to end up in a legal base that implies unanimity. This will destroy any possibility to achieve, uh, to achieve uh, this result. Uh, then, yes, we would like to have a, uh, a legislative initiative uh, that uh, has a broad vision of the different elements to be considered, but not too broad. It has to be focused. Otherwise, I mean, we cannot achieve any real concrete result. That's why we insist a lot on the fact that the two elements in this uh, legislative initiative have to be minimum wages, how to reinforce and to uh, uh, improve statutory minimum wages where they exist, but at the same time how to promote and strengthen collective bargaining institutions, uh, even by creating sometimes uh, collective bargaining institutions. And uh, the elements that you mentioned, how to reinforce trade union rights, uh, how to, uh, let's say, uh, 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 recognize who are, uh, which are the most representative social partners that are entitled to sign collective agreements that can have a legal value, and also uh, finding ways uh, to resolve the problem of uh, collective bargaining erosion that exists in many countries, while this has to be topics to be addressed. And by the way, I'm still convinced, as I said before, that the best way to uh, resolve the problem of self-employed workers and non-standard workers is not to engage again in an endless discussion on a definition of worker that uh, we were stuck in uh, for all the discussion we had on the Transparent and Predictable Working Conditions Directive. The former uh, members of the Parliament of the previous legislative term remember that. This is a, a dead end, I will say. It's better to concentrate on the fact that we have to guarantee to each and every worker regardless of their working status, the possibility to join a union, to have collective ab agreements, and to have a decent wage and decent working and living, and living conditions. Very, very last point, uh, uh, the social progress protocol was mentioned. Uh, we are struggling, of course, to make sure that in the debate on the conference on the future of Europe, uh, the social progress protocol, so making sure that social rights have the sa at least the same level of importance uh, of economic freedoms in the European Union will be part of the discussion, but unfortunately we have been very disappointed by uh, the communication of the European Commission that has uh, scrapped the text about possible treaty changes. So my suggestion is really to this Parliament, uh, let's do our best to include part the principles that we would like to see in a social progress protocol in this directive. If we can have this here, well, we have made a lot of the work we have to deliver on. 
Thank you very much, Luca. And uh, now we have coming to uh, uh, the point to conclude uh, this uh, debate and this uh, panel. And as you can see in the program, uh, we have no time for uh, my remarks or a concluding now. Oh, <laughs> uh, I think it's important that we uh, shift to the next uh, also very interesting panel. So I will see very warmly Thank you to the panelists in this panel. Uh, you have given us a lot of uh, food for thoughts and also the takeaway uh, points and a lot of, of interesting uh, suggestions. So now we have to continue our common work and I will uh, close this, uh, uh, this panel and say thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome, Agnes, and your panelists. I will go to Strasbourg. You don't go? No, not this time. Uh, and the week after, I'm not here. And I agree with you, or I guess you are not here. Yeah, I'm going to, the, to Italy. Right. Skiing. But uh, I can check if I am available tomorrow morning. It should be okay tomorrow morning. You let me know. If not, we do the, it's not a uh, weekend that. Uh, yeah. No, but uh, I, have to, I don't think I have. I have to check. Okay, if everyone can have their places, we will go to the last panel of this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, and now we are going to talk about how to ensure decent minimum wages across Europe. So now uh, everyone is invited to come up with solutions. <laughs> and I have a very highly esteemed uh, panel over here. I first give the floor, uh, and, and not yet, but I'm going to introduce them, uh, to Carla Wixer. She's working as an EU advisor uh, and research officer for the Swedish trade union, um, LO. Uh, after also working quite a lot of time here in Brussels, uh, representing the LO Sweden. Uh, and then later on I give the floor to Sasha Garben, she's a professor in law, EU law, at the College of Europe, um, on leave from the European Commission, uh, uh, and she will uh, give her, our, her insights. We also have the esteemed presence of uh, Professor Torsten Schulten, 
who's working at the VSI, the uh, Wissenschaften Sozialwissenschaftlicher Institut, <laughs> uh, 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 from the uh, Hans uh, Buckler uh, Foundation. Uh, also, a warm welcome. He is a senior researcher uh, over there. Uh, Evelyn Astor is an advisor on economic and social policies in the International Trade Union Confederation, so also in Brussels, but working with a view uh, of all of the work. And last but not least, we have the presence here of Laszlo Andor. Uh, here it says he is a uh, Hungarian economist, but in my opinion, you are a former Commissioner of Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion, uh, and now working as a Secretary General of FEPS, uh, our Progressive Research uh, 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 Institute. So, four, five uh, esteemed panelists, uh, and I hope uh, that uh, we also, before uh, half past six, uh, can give some room for questions and answers and some concluding remarks. So, I'm going to look to all the speakers if they are able to give their solutions in, let's say, five to seven minutes. Uh, uh, so we have room to have some room for question and answer. Uh, Carla, floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will try to keep the time. Uh, so the question of this um, um, panel is a hot topic, and I'm, as Agnes said, representing the Swedish Trade Union Confederation, ELO. And a bit sad to say here, maybe, that we are not so happy with the proposed initiative from the Commission. And that is regardless if you ask the trade unions in Sweden, or the employers, or even the state level. And I will try to use some of my time here to explain why this is, because I think it's important that we understand each other, even if we don't agree in the end. So, we do share the same goals. Of course, the Swedish Trade Union Confederation, ELO, also would like to have no inequalities and no social dumping on our internal market. But we don't believe that maybe an initiative on minimum wages are the solution. So I will be looking forward to um, Professor Gabor afterwards speaking about the legal basis. Uh, we do not believe that the Article 153 is a good legal basis because we don't think that the EU have competence in this area at all, according to Article 153.5. Um, this article protects not only their pay, which is then excluded, but also the right of association, the right to strike, which are basic components for a free freedom of trade unions and also social partners. It has been mentioned as well that a possible way is the article on working conditions, but as we see it, 153.5 excludes pay from this article. So <laughs> that's our main uh, point, my, our, our first point. And then I think it's important to say also, which has been said here today, that there are very many different traditions. We have traditions with state intervention on the labor market, and we, had, we also have systems as the Swedish one with a large amount of collective self-regulation, autonomous social partners. And this is what we would like to keep. And that's also why we kind of fight so hard for these issues. Um, I would say that our opposition in this question is not new. That's also important to say. When Sweden was supposed to enter into the European communities in 94, this was a prerequisite for us to join, that the collective agreement model and the labor market model remained untouched. That's also what we had guarantees from the Commission that that would be the case. And then we have seen the Laval and Viking case and so on, so we have had a fair share about issues in this part. <coughs> so, first of all, um, the, the EU lacks competence in this area, according to the articles we just mentioned. The second point is that a directive, so a legally binding instrument, would be detrimental to the Swedish labor market system because it's based upon autonomous social partners and autonomous self-regulation in the collective agreements. In Sweden we don't have a statutory minimum wage, but we don't have a collectively agreed minimum wage either. We don't have ergo omnes extension mechanisms, and we don't 
in many of the collective agreements don't have minimum wages either. We talk about wage floors or the lowest wages in the agreements, but we don't talk about minimum wages. So that's also a difference. And regardless of this, which has been mentioned several times during today's panels, the coverage of collective agreements in Sweden is very high. On the overall labor market, there is maybe 90% if you have it like this. In the blue color sector, which I represent, it's over 95% of the workers covered. And this is without extension mechanism. I just wanted to also mention shortly about what Nicola Schmidt said, because he talks about those legal guarantees, and that the European Court of Justice will interpret depending on the directive as such or the legal instrument as such. Well, even if you say something very strongly in words, the Court of Justice is still an independent judicial body as well, so they can still interpret it as they would like to. So that's a problem. We have also heard today that research and international institutions, such as the OECD, emphasizes um, the advantages of self-regulatory models, such as the Swedish one. We think that a directive or a legally binding instrument would completely undermine those advantages. That's why we are so strongly against <coughs> so instead, when the, we look at ways forward for wages and working conditions, we think recommendations could be the way forward. Uh, so if, if, you, if you need to do something on a European level, I think we think that recommendations are the best way because it allows more for adaptation depending on the variety of the different labor markets within the EU. We have developed a non-paper, as we call it. We, have, we don't have a... a it did, doesn't say that it's LO, but if you see it over here, you can take it, and it's ours, uh, in which we have uh, developed some of the ideas, and many of them have already been mentioned by, for example, Luca. Um, but we see that there is need for at least two policy recommendations, one on wages, one on collective agreements, and also probably a third initiative more linked to public procurement and funds and so on, uh, which could, could help um, in the way forward for a better social Europe. A recommendation on wage policy could then, more, most likely we would like it to address the 22 member states with statutory minimum wages, which in any case already have state intervention, because EU, EU intervention will also be state intervention, and that's the, the big difference. Um, such a recommendation can also improve transparency over wages. Social partners' influence, of course, is crucial. And also this kind of joint monitoring, so we actually see what's happening in the different countries. But as Luca already mentioned, we don't think that minimum wages is the way forward in the long term. Instead, the collective bargaining is the way forward, and that's also what we would like to support, of course, in the different member states. As we have heard, the possibility of organizing members, capacity building, but also protection against harassment, access to workplaces, etc., could be included in such a recommendation. And also the way to actually regulate wages and working condition so in collective agreements, because in many member states you don't have that possibility, and a recommendation could then encourage member states to actually give the social partners that kind of trust to regulate uh, labor market issues in collective agreements. And then also, uh, had, has been said as well, conditions for ensuring compliance with collective agreements. So, for example, labor inspections could also be part of such a recommendation. I will conclude, and I will last say also that it's important that this is not a question for us about EU, that we don't trust the EU. It's a question about the state or the EU level interfering with questions that are on the social partner kind of arena. So if you would see the same opposition from the Swedish trade unions if the Swedish government tried to interfere, for example, in wage setting. So that's an important thing to say. I think I will conclude there by saying also that LO Sweden can and would like to be constructive, but we cannot accept a binding initiative such a directive. But as long as the directive is off the table, we would try to, you know, work forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carla uh, already said, curious about the intervention of Sasha Carmen, so 
Let's all be curious about your intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, Thanks the floor very is much. Yours. Thank you. Yes, you should be, because law, as you will have found out already from what was said, is very important <laughs> in all of this, and it's too important to leave to the lawyers, right? And I'm saying this as a lawyer, okay? So take notice of this. Why is this? Because it's a technicality, yes, but like Luca said, technicalities are extremely political. And I'll try to show you that you will have to make a choice between four legal options that you have that will have drastically different political and legal consequences. So there are two options that I didn't even include in the slides because I really think you should not consider them. And that's, first of all, the flexibility clause of Article 352 which is unanimity, so forget it. There is the second option of trying to find something in the internal market. As I said in my brief comment just before, then you will end up with a Viking and Laval, so don't even consider it, okay? So what should you then consider? Of course, the two other ones, Article 153, TFEU, the social policy legal basis, which I will tell you is also unsuitable. And then potentially, because I do offer a ray of hope in all of this, I'm not, not just here to say no, the alternative, which is not being talked about as much, but which might be very promising because it has QMV and it will not lead you into the problems of having to convince the Court of Justice that you have adopted a directive on minimum wage which actually doesn't touch on minimum wage, which you will have to do on the basis of 153, okay? And that's the legal provision on social and economic cohesion, Article 175, okay? Right, so... Yes, we heard about the European Pillar of Social Rights. It's absolutely great. I love it. I'm a big fan and it has this principle six and that's all very nice and well. But of course, it is not, first of all, legally binding. Secondly, it doesn't give any social rights that you can enforce. And thirdly, most importantly for our purposes, it's no legal basis, right? So at the same time, forget about it. Um, Article 153 then. Okay, so is this the holy grail? I know you, you don't carry a copy of the treaty with you, um, but you really should try to read Article 153 at some point and go to paragraph 5 of it. Yeah? This paragraph says, the provisions of this article shall not apply to pay. So everything that went before in that article is giving options for EU action in various ways. And then this provision says, this shall not apply to pay. That means you don't have a legal basis to do anything meaningful on pay in Article 153. It's not that difficult. That's really what it says, right? Now, what makes it perhaps a little bit difficult is that you can have some measures adopted on the basis of 153, such as protection of fixed-term workers, that then touch on pay, because pay is one of the elements of their working conditions for which they have to receive equal treatment. And the court has said, okay, that is fine. But the court has said already in unequivocal terms in that regard, that Article 1535 means that, well, at least on the basis of 153, you cannot set the, the establishment of the level of all or some of the constituent parts of pay and or the level of pay in the member states or the setting of a minimum guaranteed wage is excluded. It's not that difficult, yeah? So you can't use Article 153 if you want to do something meaningful on minimum wage, okay? So what can you do with 153? You could do something that terribly disappoints citizens. 
You could do something that says we're sort of doing something on minimum wage, but then the actual substance of the measure will avoid trying to do anything that actually does that in order to not run into problems if the measure is then attacked by Sweden or somebody else in front of the Court of Justice, right? <coughs> so if you want to disappoint citizens with a false promise... Yes, then you should really go for Article 153. So, okay. Now, I didn't come just as the bearer of bad news, although my natural inclination as a lawyer is to say to the politicians who like to say yes, that sometimes the answer is no. I also think there might be some scope for creativity here. And that is on the basis of social and, and uh, economic cohesion. So there is a chapter on this in the treaties that starts with Article 174, and I reproduced it here. It's, that's the kind of framework we have to look at. In order to promote its overall harmonious development, the Union shall develop and pursue actions leading to the strengthening of its economic, social, and territorial cohesion. And if I listened well to the commissioner that spoke before and many of the other contributions that were made, you can make an argument that this measure is not just about reducing inequalities within the member states, but between the member states. And it's about upward convergence, and it's about you know, the intrinsically connected labor markets functioning better in this European context where we have free movement of, of, uh, of economic factors and so on. I think you can make the argument. And then, indeed, you have Article 175. I'm sorry, I have to t tell you about these articles because it's really important, um, that says if actions prove necessary outside the funds and so on to achieve social and uh, economic cohesion, you can adopt, well, this is, of course, it's slightly contestable, you can ad adopt specific actions, and so then you would have to see if specific actions, but I'll come to that in a moment, includes harmonizing legislation but by qualified majority voting, ordinary legislative procedure. So, that means you would have to do two things, well, one thing very, very carefully especially. You would have to show that this m directive really helps to reduce disparities and, and to, le to contribute significantly to the harmonious development of the union. I saw a lot of evidence already that this could be the case. That's not my area of expertise, but if you tell me that an economic case can be made for that, and if an impact assessment can produce you know, studies on that, I'm pretty confident that in principle the cr criteria for using this legal basis are fulfilled. Yes, it means you have to read this legal basis creatively and with a bit of courage. Um, but I think there are elements in the case law that actually support this. The court has previously said that the, the discretion of the union legislator in using this uh, legal basis is wise. It has already also said that this policy area includes economic and social progress. So I think you have a lot to work with. Now, this is, of course, the depressing slide um, that I have to include as a lawyer. I'll try to be short, but it's still very important to say. Of course, it's not a risk-free option either, right? Um, you, so there is a, there, there are a range of uncertainties. I don't want to tire you too much with it, but there is a legal question, let me put it like this, whether the... the Art, the paragraph 5 in Article 153 that I mentioned before, this exclusion of pay, whether this applies to all the legal bases in the treaties or just 153. I argue, and I think I have quite a number of scholars on my side on that, that it only applies to Article 153 because it says that the provisions of this article shall not apply to pay. So this article, not any of the provisions in the treaty, right? So there's very strong textual support. Okay. Um, I will leave the other things aside uh, because I ran out of time, but if you want, we can go into this in the discussion. 
Just so let me conclude with these points. There is no ideal legal basis to do what we have been discussing and what we, I think, agree on uh, should happen. But that doesn't have to be the end of the discussion. I don't think Article 153 is a viable way forward because either you do something that is going to be too ambitious and the court will strike it down on the basis of 1535, or you do something that is not ambitious enough and then you will disappoint all the citizens. So think about alternatives, think about Article 175, ask lawyers, but engage with them. Don't just leave it to them, but really try to engage with them as politicians on this. Have some courage and creativity and also encourage the lawyers to have some courage and creativity, and then this may just happen. Thanks. I noted down this uh, courage and creativity. Uh, so thank you for, for that. Uh, uh, and I think in the end we will conclude that we need it. Uh, uh, but first, don't know if we're going to listen to an optimistic or a pessimistic story. Uh, I give the floor to Thorsten Schulten uh, uh, for his contribution. Can I be... The clicker? The clicker, clicker as well. No, that's not the clicker. No. Is it the clicker? Yeah, yeah, I it think is. so, it is. Very modern. Just need to find my presentation. No, it's not... Yeah, hello everybody. Thanks uh, for inviting me. Yeah, I try to make an optimistic um, outlook as uh, it, I think it's now 15 years ago when I wrote together with some colleagues from France and Switzerland what we call thesis for a European minimum wage policy. And this was a time where everyone said, hey, you're totally crazy about talking about these kinds of things. Yeah, and I'm really satisfied that after 15 years we are now here sitting here and we're really seriously discussing about it. And what I, uh, before I come to, uh, not my conclusion, what I would suggest as a conclusion, uh, two remarks. The first uh, remark I want to make is, I mean, we should keep in mind, and this has been said very clearly by Niklas Schmidt also, also uh, this afternoon, that what we see in Europe at the moment with this initiative is a totally change in the discourse and the, the, the way how we treat wages. This is really remarkable. I would say such an argument, uh, document as a consultation document we see now was not possible probably three or four years ago because at that time the discourse was totally different. It was about minimum wages are bad things, wages are too high, minimum wages are limiting downward flexibility, all these kind of arguments and we all know the recommendation in the European semester in, in the even worse in the Troika policy. You all know that story. So, so what we really see is a shift, and we have to recognize it, because that's also to a certain extent, it's your success, it's the success of the European labor movement, and it's the su success of all these people who had always criticized this, what you might call neoliberal policy on wages. So this is the first uh, remark. And the second remark, I just wanted to make you aware about the fact, I mean, the debate on European minimum wages is, as I said, quite old. It's not a very new debate. But for a very long time, it was something in the cloud, in the European cloud. It had nothing to do with the reality in the member states. And this is different now, I would say. That's one of my thesis and maybe also one of my ground for optimism. What we see at the moment, here you might see it as a symbol, not only in Europe, but especially in many European countries, you see a big movement for much higher minimum wages. And I give you the example of my own country, which is Germany. And you know Germany had just five years ago introduced a minimum wage. And we were very fine about it. By the way, there's a lot of things to say to the Swedish colleague because we had very similar debates on this issue. Also, there was a lot of skepticism and fears. In particular, does the minimum wage would weaken our bargaining system. But now, if you ask German trade unionists, I would say in general, we can't really see that uh, relation. But what we see is that there is no eyes or or, there's no minimum wage, statutory minimum wage against collective bargaining, but it's more how you could use both instruments complementary in the areas where it's useful to use them. So there is no principal contradiction between the two. That's what I would say 
is the experiences we made in Germany. And now we have the debate on a much higher minimum wage because we said we, we were successful with this, but there is a general assessment. Now it's very much too low, and we want to go. There's a debate on 12 euro, and luckily the 12 euro would correspond to 60% of the median wage in Germany. So there is also a kind of coincidence to the European affair. But it's not only Germany. We have a lot. We have it in Holland, the campaign of the FNFA. We have here in Belgium the campaign for 14 euros from, from, from the FGTB. We heard this morning already or, uh, about Spain and the big increases there. We have the living wage debates in the UK. We also have a lot of initiative in Eastern European countries. A colleague from Romania was talking about that, but we have other countries. And you can see here, we just listed, and maybe the list is even longer, uh, uh, you, the, you can see there is really a movement in many countries for much higher minimum wages. And I see this initiative as an opportunity really to bring together these initiatives and really to make a joint force out of it. And, and I think that you have to keep in mind uh, what's really the background for this. Okay, skip this. So what is now required? Uh, in the commission document there are four points already mentioned. And I think, of course, the most important is the question of wage adequacy, so the level question, because that's the question what people interest, and that's also the question in the end, if normal people say, this is a good initiative or not, if it inc really increase your wages. And that's also a little bit the problem with recommendation. I mean, we have a lot of experiences with European recommendation, but the impact is really limited. And so you can have nice recommendation, but if the people say, yeah, you made a recommendation, but it had no impact for my day-to-day -day life, then it really creates a problem, then it creates frustration, and then creates the situation that people are even more disappointed from the European project. So in that sense, I think if there is an opportunity for a directive, and I totally agree with Luca in that point, we have to go for it. We have to, to need a kind of... Uh, regulation which really helps people, which in the end improves the minimum wages and are not just a symbolic policy with no impact. So that, that would be my, my countdown mix. And now about what is an adequate uh, minimum wage, and we heard already something from, from Patrick as, uh, as well. We know the famous Kites Index, which I think is indeed one indicator. And then the Commission talked about gross or net wages. And here I think is a big danger. I would highly recommend not to go for net wages. Why? First of all, it makes the thing unbelievably complicated because you have to discuss about tax systems, social security system, and of course you can't harmonize these systems with the minimum wage. It's too much. Second point, it shifts the responsibility. If you go look for an approach for gross wages, it's very clear the employer has the impossibility to pay a decent wage under which tax system you ever have. But that's clear. If you shift it to a net perspective, then the responsibility is also shifted. Then the employer said, yeah, we pay the wages, but the state could reduce the taxes. And the state might say, yeah, but you should pay higher tax. There's no clear responsibility. And in the end, they play against each other. So I don't think this is a good uh, approach. And then we have, of course, the whole debate of modern living wages, but usually based on a basket of goods. And here you also might think, could there be a European approach, a European basket? And I worry also very much doubt about that this is a good, that we really would end up with a, with, a, with a joint definition of a European basket. I mean, even at a national level, you can uh, uh, discuss this for decades without finding a real solution. So in the end, I would say the Kites Index is the most feasible and pragmatic or criteria. And you should not forget, I mean, you should not undermine cement, even if the Kites Index is not the perfect indicator. It would, if you really would go to the 60%, improve wages of more than 50 million workers in Europe. And that's something, to be honest. And that's so much and so important that it would be really a shame not to use this opportunity here at the moment. And therefore, I think the Kites Index should be the main indicator. But as I said, it's not perfect. It's not always working. We had the examples of Bulgaria. So what you might could do is, in addition to the Kites Index, to give the Kites Index what you might call a reality check. 
And by reality check, I mean, if you calculate the 60% of the median wage level, then you really have to see at the national level, is this really sufficient? Or is it still a poverty wage because the overall wages are too low? So if you combine these two perspectives, you have the Cates Index as a pragmatic solution on the basic, and then a reality check in advance, this might could be a, a, a system of function. And finally, of course, collective bargaining has to be strengthened in even to have adequate median wages. And here I would say I was not satisfied. I liked the speech of Nicholas Smith, but what he said on collective bargaining, creating capacities, okay, we talk about that also for decades. It has never really had a real impact. So we have here, if, if we really take uh, the idea serious of strengthening collective bargaining, also from the EU level, then we have to think about much stronger instruments. And i just give you one example, which I think might be an instrument. This is the whole question of what are the criteria for public procurement? What are the criteria for social funds, for your funds? Here, I mean, in the end, it's about the idea of giving public money only to companies which are covered or reduce collective agreements. That would be the basic idea. But I would advise not to put this in this directive, because then it's overdone. This is a different approach, it's a necessary approach, but my view would be say here, focus on the minimum wage and in addition to that, make sure that you have additional, more initiative to strengthen quality of plug -in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thorsten. And I saw uh, Carla nodding quite fiercely on, on the public <laughs> procurement. On the end. Oh, on the public procurement. That was so. Uh, in the end, there was we something agree, you were we? agreeing <laughs> okay. on, which, which was, I must say, uh, uh, quite nice. Thank you for uh, this uh, perspective. Um, and now I give the floor to Evelyn Astor. Like I said, coming from also Brussels, but from the Brussels with the real international perspective. Um, I give the floor to you, Asa. Bye. Thanks very much. Um, so this panel is largely focused on the what. Uh, what should a new initiative at EU level uh, look like? Um, but as you know, the ETUC is currently um, consulting its members right now on the details of that. So I would like to take a step back and look at more the why. Uh, why is this relevant for the EU? Uh, why is this uh, a question for EU-level action? And uh, we've heard a little bit before uh, in the previous discussions, uh, talks about divergence, um, upward social convergence not being met. I would like to expand on that a little bit, and I'd like to uh, back that up with some stylized facts and figures. And I would like to point your attention uh, particularly to the Eastern European region, uh, where we are seeing uh, really low wages and, and, and really poor working conditions um, compared to the rest of Europe. Uh, and I'll say something mostly about countries in the EU, but I think it's also important for us to remember that we have a number of countries that are aspiring to have EU membership outside the EU for the moment, um, and how they may be affected by this as well. Um, this is a kind of uh, tricky graph, um, so I would just not like to um, go through and analyze all of it, but just to say this is looking at the progression of average wages um, for a number of Eastern Euro European countries uh, from 2010 to 2017, that's the latest data that we have, looking at the <coughs> EU15, uh, so the so-called old member states, mostly in Western Europe, uh, Bulgaria, Croatia within the EU, and then a number of uh, countries that are outside the EU but are aspiring for membership. Uh, what you can see uh, on the right uh, is essentially how the wages of these different, uh, the average wages of these different countries um, factor as a percentage into the average wages of the EU 15. And I think that the um, the, the image is, is quite shocking when you look at Bulgaria, for example, uh, with average wages representing less than 20% of the average wages of the EU15, uh, Croatia around a third of the average wages, and as Luca Vicentini um, pointed out earlier, uh, these differences cannot be accounted for when it comes in terms of cost of living and productivity. Um, 
Yes, there are differences in cost of living, but uh, it's not fivefold in Bulgaria. Uh, what you can also see is a general trend of wage uh, stagnation in most, not all of these countries, but most of these countries and, and also within the EU15. Um, for governments in a number of Eastern European countries, um, the growth strategy has been largely uh, to maintain low labor costs through low wages, uh, and, and sort of unregulated poor working conditions as a strategy to try to attract foreign direct investment, uh, employment, competitiveness, and growth. And Eastern Europe is growing. Um, in fact, uh, the growth rates in some of the Eastern European member states are uh, almost double that of the EU average. Look at Romania, for example. Um, but this growth has been accompanied by increased levels of inequality, um, and also very high levels of poverty. This is a chart that's showing uh, the um, rate of workers who are um, at risk of poverty and exclusion. Uh, so uh, according to the EU definition, earning less than 60% of the median income. And on the right, you see those workers who are uh, severely materially deprived, so unable to afford a basic set of um, household items and, and uh, services. Uh, and what you can see overall is that within Eastern Europe, um, the levels of in-work poverty uh, tend to be higher. Croatia might look like they're doing better than the EU average when you look at the relative me poverty measure, but when you look at severe material deprivation, on the other hand, they're actually doing worse than the EU average, and that's also because of the fact that wages tend to be depressed overall, a point that Nicholas Schmidt mentioned earlier. And um, why are workers um, earning poverty wages? Well, uh, minimum wages have a lot to do with this. They're not the only reason, but uh, what we can see is that the level of minimum wages uh, within Eastern European countries are uh, extremely low. Um, and this is exacerbated by the fact that there is rather low levels of collective bargaining coverage in the region, uh, which make it difficult for workers to actually collectively negotiate improvements to their uh, wages and, and working conditions. So in this slide you see in blue uh, the level of the minimum wage. I've expressed it in gross, even though in some countries um, the net take-home pay is substantially less, like in Romania. And the green bar is the average uh, cost of living basket for um, a family, for an average sized family. Uh, these are nationally specific baskets because it's very um, difficult to have a, a common methodology on cost of living, but uh, nevertheless what you can see if you compare the gross level of minimum wages, let's look at Bulgaria, um, that's 286 uh, euros a month, uh, and you compare that to the estimated basic costs of a family for four, estimated at around 1,200 euros, um, that means that if you have two full-time earners on the minimum wage, uh, you basically are unable to afford um, even half of what is needed in order to support a family. Um, so this is obviously very problematic, but beyond just the implications in terms of poverty and deprivation, um, this is this growth strategy, this low-wage growth strategy, um, has led to massive levels of emigration uh, because we have an increasingly um, integrated labor market. Um, we have freedom of movement. We also have, for the Western Balkan countries, um, visa-free travel arrangements. Uh, and uh, the working conditions and the wages are not sufficiently attractive to actually retain the working age population. Uh, we talked a little bit about the figures before. Around 2.5 million Romanians, that's 20% of the home country population, they currently live abroad. They're, that's 14% of Croatians who are living abroad currently, 12.5% of Bulgarians. The EU average of, uh, of workers living abroad, 3.5%. Just to give you a, a stark uh, image of, uh, of the divergence here. And when you look at those who are outside of the EU, the, in terms of Western Balkans, the UNDP has estimated that around one-third of Balkan nationals currently live abroad. So these trends are um, they're contributing to the region's dramatic demographic decline. In the long term, there's also a concern um, from unions, from policymakers, about the sustainability of public finances here. 
Um, in Croatia, if you look, for example, at migration trends combined with fertility trends, you'll see 18% fewer people living in Croatia between 2050 and 2020, this year. And if you compare 2050 to 1990, it's 42%. Um, we're seeing already in the short term skill shortages, uh, for example, doctors, uh, nurses in the region, educated long, young people are leaving the country to seek better opportunities. And we see even shortages in other sectors like uh, construction workers uh, in Romania, for example. We see a lot of construction workers from Romania here in Belgium, but actually there's a problem in terms of attracting a sufficient amount of construction workers in Romania. There are other economic consequences as well. I don't think I have time to dig into them, but you know, low wages, the evidence is very clear around the negative effects in terms of domestic demand. Um, the effects of uh, low minimum wages on informality because uh, the conditions in the formal labor market are not sufficiently attractive or sufficient to help workers get by. And I think also social cohesion cannot be understated as well. You see in Eastern Europe uh, very, very low levels of trust in institutions according to the European Social Survey. So what do we want? Uh, I think that that's uh, the, really the key question of this panel. Um, so since July of last year, the ITUC um, and uh, national trade union centers in Eastern Europe, uh, we've launched a campaign um, for fair wages. It's called Fair Pay in Eastern Europe to Eat, to Live, and to Stay. And you'll see a campaign brief uh, printed in the front if you want more information about it. But what we're asking for in short is that governments should set statutory minimum wage floors uh, that are evidence-based, that take into consideration the cost of living, that are developed with full involvement of social partners, and at the same time, they want governments to actually step up, ensure and promote collective bargaining rights to achieve fair wages above a statutory minimum level. Um, and I should really say that within this campaign, unions do not see a conflict between asking for uh, raised minimum wages and asking for strengthened collective bargaining. These are two complementary objectives. Um, statutory wa wage floors through minimum wages, these can serve actually as an important benchmark above which uh, unions can negotiate fair wages above the minimum. Um, unions also want to see coordination uh, between uh, European countries on wages. Uh, because they believe that if governments can jointly support and promote minimum wages and collective bargaining, we can avoid this downward competition on the basis of wages and, and uh, labor costs. Uh, and we also think that this coordination is really important in order to stem the tide of massive emigration from Eastern Europe, counter this skill depletion and this demographic decline. And this is not... Um, this is not going to be uh, useless for Western European countries either. We've heard about stagnating wages compared to productivity. Uh, we've heard also about declining collective bargaining coverage. Uh, we've, we, we know that the situation in Western Europe is not perfect, but the situation in Eastern Europe is really stark. Uh, and so that's why I focused my intervention on that. Okay. Uh, so um, I think I'll stop here. Uh, just to conclude, I think that um, really, if we are not addressing these divergences, there is a serious threat to EU integration and the uh, stated objective of the EU towards upward social convergence. So this is why we really want an initiative that takes wages, low wages in particular, out of competition. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And then now for the last speaker in this panel, Laszlo. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation, also on behalf of FEPS. Uh, and I would like to join those um, who say that Nicolas Schmidt should be uh, supported in this effort. This is a very important um, uh, initiative, and this support is uh, especially important for him because on a daily basis, maybe on an hourly basis, he meets people who say that, look, you know, this might be an interesting idea, but it's not a silver bullet. The evidence base is not so obvious. The legal base is uh, difficult. Um, it's not an EU competence anyhow. 
and if all these arguments fall, there is an ultimate uh, 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 argument if someone comes with a good initiative in Brussels that the Germans don't want it. <laughs> and uh, now I think... Uh, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, now, so I, I think uh, this is a, a little revolution uh, here because, um, in fact, uh, you know, it's not only the, uh, a German head of the commission who is supporting, but um, l last year it was in the SPD, uh, program to uh, to go for this, um, despite the fact that in Germany itself, as uh, Dr. Schulten was explaining, it's a relatively recent um, uh, uh, institution to have a statutory uh, minimum uh, wage. So from this point of view, I also uh, see that uh, this, this has been a high-speed change, um, a very rapid change in terms of the paradigm and the discourse. Um, for those who are interested in the history of this, it was first time the 2012 employment package of the Commission, uh, which uh, proposed that all countries should have a minimum wage. It did not claim any kind of intervention from the EU side about the methodology, but just put forward this idea that all countries, perhaps even Germany, uh, should have uh, one, and then this took place about 18 months before the Social Democrats joined the Grand Coalition, and this, I think, is very important for those who say that nothing good came out of the Grand Coalition or the ministership of Andrea Nales, because this is something very, very concrete, and I think the German minimum wage uh, has had, um, first of all, a success, but secondly, a European importance, because it helped shifting uh, the paradigm on uh, wages and uh, wage uh, setting. It did tackle a large amount of in work poverty in uh, uh, Germany and shows an example and creates the appetite to do something similar uh, at the EU level because Germany can be an obstacle if it wants to be uh, for good initiatives. But, 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 but I think it's very good that if something uh, works well, they want to export it. And, uh, and, and there are many reasons uh, for exporting it. Uh, I think the European Pillar of Social Rights created a narrative in which um, uh, this institution can be uh, brought uh, to the European uh, level. And many good arguments were also put forward uh, two years ago in the trade union campaign uh, when they spoke about Europe uh, needing and deserving a wage uh, increase. And again, for the historians, there was a very interesting approach put forward uh, suggesting that uh, there should be a kind of target in terms of by which year uh, the wage levels should reach the 60% of the median wage in each and every country. That's what the trade unions put forward uh, two, two, two years ago. Very interesting concept, but uh, with targets, what very often happens is that you agree on a target, and every morning when you wake up, you pray uh, that the target should be reached uh, uh, somehow. Um, and of course, this is not the most uh, convincing enforcement mechanism uh, in Europe or elsewhere. Now, um, so appreciating that uh, the, the narrative has changed so quickly, I mean, in historical terms, this is a very, very quick uh, process. What I would like to argue is that despite all the skepticism which may come uh, from various uh, places, including uh, Nordic trade unions, um, what we speak about today is a silver bullet. Not in the sense that it would solve all the problems, but it contributes to the solution of many problems. And uh, I would just like to highlight five uh, almost all of them have been uh, mentioned in the discussion, but for the sake of summary, I think uh, this, uh, this should be useful. Um, the Commissioner also started with uh, the emphasis on in-work poverty. Uh, very few people, apart from me, remember that 10 years ago, a Europe 2020 strategy was launched. And one of the headline targets of uh, the Europe 2020 strategy, which was at that time considered to be a modest uh, target to lift at least 20 million people out of poverty or social exclusion. Now, in 2020, some, maybe in the Eurostat, because the Eurostat still follows this, um, they, they will uh, find out that the actual achievement is much less uh, than 20. So the European Union, 
the member states, because it has been primarily their competence, uh, 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 only manage something which is much weaker than a modest ambition set out in 2010 in this field. And um, it's paradoxical because there have been a lot of talk today about Romania and other East European countries, but interestingly, it came actually from Romania and Poland, um, where thanks to the reduction of material deprivation, uh, the, the biggest, uh, biggest progress has been made in terms of the reduction of poverty or social exclusion, but what concerns uh, relative poverty, income inequality, there is no progress in Europe in, 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 in general. And what is primarily responsible for this is in work poverty. This is, this is, this is very, very important, working age uh, 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 poverty. Now, uh, so um, uh, uh, the support from the side of the minimum wage setting, um, if, it's, if it's decisive, if it's not a cosmetic uh, approach, it's, if it's not a, a kind of um, wish uh, uh, preached in the European semester, um, of course, it can uh, help. Now, the second um, uh, point is the single market. When we discuss the East-West imbalance, uh, in my view, we have to be more explicit that this is an issue of the single market. And uh, this, it's, it's about the, the cohesion in the single market, um, because um, without convergence, and especially with divergence, uh, the, the cohesion of the single market weakens or even falls. And what we are witnessing is that you know, through um, higher than average GDP growth, the Eastern countries are converging in terms of GDP, because everybody knows that the Polish, Romanian, and other GDP growth is about twice as high as the Eurozone. It's not that hard. Uh, but, but there is no social convergence coupled to this. So there have been, at least 10 years ago, a massive decoupling between economic convergence and social one. Why? Because of the industrial relations, because of the welfare states are much, much weaker. And um, it's not only that they are weaker by accident, um, but um, uh, this is, by the way, on the right side, the fresh, just a few days old euros uh, map which shows that you know, minimum wage is are much paler um, uh, in the east than in the west. But um, what I want to jump to is this: that um, the minimum wages uh, in um, uh, in the eastern countries are lagging behind because it has been a policy to compete by lower costs, including lower wage costs. So what we speak about is a growth model of the Eastern countries where unions are weaker by design, social dialogue is weaker by design. So if, if you know, providing assistance to countries to strengthen it, if they don't want to strengthen it, because they, they believe that uh, this is what makes them competitive against your countries, um, one, two, three. <laughs> Exactly. So uh, um, uh, then, then we have to have a different approach. And indeed, uh, we can speak about the lack of sustainability of this model, which maintains about a 15 percentage point gap between uh, the wage share uh, in manufacturing uh, between the European average and the Visegrad uh, countries. Um, uh, we, we have to speak about the lack of sustainability of this model, partly for economic reasons, the so-called uh, middle income trap, but also because of the demographic decline, which was just pointed out by several speakers before me. The third uh, point where the silver bullet would function is the EMU. Uh, Luca and others referred to this, that there were the dark middle ages when uh, the commission was advocating the reduction of the minimum wage, and luckily we are not in a crisis. But uh, what I would like to uh, stress is that in the absence of uh, some new tool which protects the minimum wages, in the next crisis, there will be too many people around, including in the Commission, who learn nothing and forgot nothing. And then they will come again with the push to hold back wages or reduce the minimum wage in country X or country B, uh, because there is no other firm instrument against that kind of uh, uh, attitude. Uh, the case of Greece, of course, should be studied. For, uh, by, by, by those who 
who want to uh, look into that and also the ridiculous argument that were put forward at that time. The number four is uh, the, the, the overall wage share of the European Union. This has also been mentioned, but this is also something uh, where, in fact, the European government is just, governance is just set in a way that surplus countries, Germany and the Netherlands, um, uh, just hold bank wage increases and maintain these extraordinary surpluses on the current account, which creates the great imbalances. More dynamic wage growth could help, but they cannot produce it. That they, can, they cannot produce it and they cannot tackle the imbalances in the monetary union. And instead of that, it's the countries of the periphery, or namely the South, uh, which are pushed into a, a deflationary uh, 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 cycle. So um, uh, a, a stronger push would also help in this respect. And the final one is the gender pay gap, where I think it was exactly Nicola Schmidt who uh, elaborated on this uh, very, very clearly. There are a lot more women um, uh, uh, working um, at or close to minimum wage, uh, retail sector, health sector, and you name it, uh, where this really makes a great uh, difference. I heard today the Commissioner, Commissioner Daly, uh, speaking about the intentions to work on transparency, but working on transparency is insufficient uh, if you want to close um, the, the, the gender pay gap in a meaningful way. And besides these five points, of course, there are many other anomalies where a European action could uh, help. Uh, for example, the Hungarian case where, yes, there has been some dynamics to improve the minimum wage, but it doesn't apply to those who participate in the public work schemes. And that can be hundreds of thousands, uh, not small numbers. Uh, so it's, very, it's, it's practically cheating uh, what has been around. Or other cases uh, where uh, some uh, groups are excluded on the ground of age. If you are too young, you don't get uh, the minimum wage, and I think a European framework should also help in this field. So, yes, I know there is skepticism. I think um, I heard Sasha uh, several times, um, and um, of course uh, I, I respect uh, uh, your views, and that, that should be um, uh, the one um, for others also to consider uh, at least, um, but, but everyone who says, okay, the EU should not interfere in wages and wage setting. Look, what happened with the posted workers directive? Uh, because it has been helping the high income countries, the EU did intervene in wages and wage setting. Because in 1996, when Sweden was already in the European Union, they declared that the receiving countries minimum wage should apply, and more recently, um, uh, the, the, the actual remuneration was equalized uh, so if you know, a, a, an EU tool helps you, you like it. If an EU tool would help someone else, uh, you don't necessarily like it. And um, uh, it's a kind of general skepticism of, uh, about social Europe, while you know, enthusiasm to TTIP and other things makes um, a very interesting profile uh, of uh, the Swedish uh, uh, unions, which we otherwise in, admire, because everybody would love to be Sweden, um, but, um, but, but we need a bit of an assistance um, for that. Whether this would put Europe on a slippery slope, because that's also a kind of argument that, oh, you open this door and then you don't, you don't know what else comes. Look, I think that door has to be opened, and the minimum, the minimum wage coordination should be followed with unemployment reinsurance, uh, should be followed with uh, Perhaps so. La, la primera cuestión eh, es agradecer todos los aportes que se han hecho desde aquí. Y sí me hubiera gustado, esto lo digo a la organización, que la única, casi la única visión de una organización sindical nacional. Maybe you can speak English. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Sorry. You yeah. can speak English. Okay. There's, a there's a problem with the translation. Yeah. That's fine. Oh, the, the translation has finished, finished. because so, we are yeah. over time. Oh, no, Excuse me. Yeah. Sorry. English. Okay. You should have asked for the floor earlier. Excuse me. Yeah. No, but I, I would have liked, because the only uh, national trade union that has been represented on the table, it was somebody that was not in favor, our colleagues from ELO. I would have liked to see any other confederation from the south or from the east that could have maybe had a different point of view. In my case, coming from Spain, um, 
I can say that we, I don't think that we are right when we are talking about the Swedish model, because this was the model also in my country, where we once, and it was just 10 years ago, we had 81% of collective bargaining coverage, and right now, due to the recommendations of the European Commission that, by the way, have sanctions, and you have to remember it has sanctions, so it's not just a simple recommendation as we are talking here, let's go for recommendations. No, I want the same kind of recommendations. We have gone from 81% to less than 64%, and that was the Spanish model as well, and it was the model of Germany, and it was the model of Greece, and it was the model of so many countries all over Europe. For me, it's very difficult to talk about com uh, when we are talking about a constructive, that we want to be constructive, but we are saying that either it's our model or it's no other model. And if we are crossing this line, we are not into being constructive. And we have said very clear that uh, mm, it has been said here before uh, that uh, in Spain we have achieved uh, by the way, it was said that, uh, that, the employ that the employers are on fire. They are not on fire. They signed the agreement. And this was due to a uh, socialist prime minister, by the way, Pedro Sánchez. So you have to put into value as well what socialist governments can do. They can sit the employees, employers and, and, and trade union representatives and go for a measurement that has been largely applauded in the whole country, but probably in the whole Europe. Because, and this is my conclusion, sorry for, 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 for the time, this is my conclusion. It's very difficult for me to be seated here in the European Parliament, the most democratic institution of the European Union, talking about wages like if it was something that was coming from the river. And we are among politicians, and politicians have to take the initiatives. And if the treaties do not allow to do something, politicians are here to change the treaties as well. And maybe this is something you should all consider and not just be focused on article, I'm sorry, 150-something, 70-something, but maybe we can change and we should change the treaties and the policies because the result in many countries of the big increasing in vote that socialists have had are due to this promise. And it's very, very, very weird if they cannot honor the promise or they will end up again where we know that we can end up. Thanks. Thank you for putting some extra ambition uh, in the last part of the uh, debate. Can I go just a quick round? Uh, uh, people want to respond, but, but really quick, because I think in 10 minutes' time we should leave the building. Uh, uh, um, uh -huh. So, huh? Uh, Carla, do you want to respond? Or do you, so, if you say, I, I said what I had to say, also okay, but... I just say some words very short, like these legal guarantees that we talk about, we, we don't see how they are legally going to work. So that's also important to say. And then just a question on, on coverage, because we have also heard about the ergo omnis, the extensions. And our legal analysis says that if there is a directive, in any case, mm -hmm. a directive will be binding to all member states. Mm -hmm. And the idea of a directive is also to kind of um, embrace everyone. And that's the problem for us, because in our system we know that there are a lack. Um, everybody is not covered by collective agreements. But that's a very, sh very small amount. And the idea that in Germany, we respect, of course, that you have changed your system, but that was a change that came from within. It was the social partners who decide that on their own. And maybe in you know, 50 years we will decide the same, but we will not that the EU shall decide that for us. So, okay. thank you. Thank you. Position clear. Uh, Sasha. Yes. Um, legally, you can have a very convincing derogation in a directive. You can do that. Um, and I will tell you when you can and cannot do things, honestly. Um, I, uh, I, I agree with what uh, you were saying. Uh, this is the problem, I think, with the current approach. If it goes down the road that has been set out in, this, in the consultation, I'm, I fear it will be a, a middle-of-the-road initiative that will disappoint uh, everyone and might do more damage than good. So I would say, perhaps in response to this consultation, the people in this room should try to push for the alternative because I'm not sure uh, if you understood me correctly. I'm saying that actually, surprisingly, the treaty may give you the competence, but on, indeed, another legal basis. 
if you want to change the treaty and create the perfect legal basis to do this, then of course that's even better. Okay. Um, no last contributions anymore? Uh, I think it was uh, indeed a last, uh, a very nice last uh, remark. If we can change, uh, if we need to change the world, we have to change the world. Uh, and uh, I'm also uh, quite convinced that we can change the world if we work together. So this is why it's important to listen to the concerns of everyone. Uh, uh, and see if we can come up with a common and balanced uh, uh, solution, but also a solution which gives us the pushing power to push for change, because uh, uh, not only did everyone agree on the public procurement as a part of the solution, but I think uh, the change in the debate. You mentioned the fact that social issues are on the agenda, uh, that didn't happen out of nothing. We pushed for uh, uh, for this, and, and now it also gives us, I think, uh, uh, and I hope, the courage mm -hmm. and the creativity to work out a silver bullet for the problems concluded. So thank you very much for those people who stayed until the end. Um, a lot of food for thought, so thank you for the panelists uh, uh, for, uh, for this. This is not the last debate uh, on this topic, uh, and thank you for everyone who enriched this debate. Thank you.